Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our tutorial on hyperbolic networks. I'm Chandan Reddy. I'm a professor of computer science at Virginia Tech. I'm also an Amazon scholar. This tutorial will be presented along with uh, my PhD student at Virginia Tech, Nurendra Chaudhary, and our collaborators at Amazon, Nikhil Rao, Karthik Subayan, and Srinivasan Sangamedu. In this tutorial, we will be talking about the theoretical intuition and architectural designs and uh, various real world applications of hyperbolic networks. So here is the basic outline of the tutorial. We will start with motivating the need for hyperbolic space in real world applications and where it can be successful and how to use them. And then we will dig into the theoretical uh, aspects of hyperbolic geometry, including hyperbolic operations and the activation functions that are needed to design hyperbolic uh, deep learning architectures. We will also discuss some of the optimization techniques that are used for uh, successfully uh, uh, training these models. In terms of the architectural designs, we will start with basic linear uh, layer and then talk about sequential models like recurrent layers and convolutional layers. After that, we will discuss the hyperbolic transformers and we will get into alternative formulations of hyperbolic uh, uh, networks. Then we will talk about the applications of uh, hyperbolic networks, given that we are in the web conference where we have a lot of uh, applications related to web, as well as we have some of the uh, applications in the domain of uh, search, in especially product search. And we will also talk about some applications related to natural language processing. And towards the end, we will conclude our uh, tutorial and describing the open-ended challenges in this domain, as well as some of the future uh, potential directions that one can uh, possibly work on. All the tutorial uh, materials along with these slides and preferably or uh, the videos that are available, that will be available by this WWW conference are going to be available at uh, this tutorial website. So let's get into the motivation. As you might know already, neural networks have really been very successful in several real world applications, including web applications and financial applications. And it has been effectively handling data in very complex forms, ranging from open ended uh, natural language data that can obtain that can be obtained from social media or some of the spatial correlated data uh, in geospatial applications. Also, it has been successful in many mission critical applications like healthcare and autonomous uh, driving and so on and so forth. Given all these applications where uh, real world data has been uh, in different forms, there are various modalities that one can uh, think about and different uh, deep learning architectures have been designed for these handling these uh, different modalities. For example, graph neural networks have been designed successfully for handling graph data. Transformers have been used in uh, handling textual data and sequential models like RNN, LSTM, GRUs have been used for uh, handling time series data and a convolutional neural network have been used uh, for handling spatial data or image data. Most of these models assume that the underlying space is Euclidean because the math is well formulated and the loss functions are easy to optimize once we make this assumption. However, when we talk about real world applications, there is a lot of hierarchical information that is embedded in these uh, domains, right? For example, if you take graph uh, applications, there can be hierarchical uh, communities that are formed in this graph and there might be relationships that are hierarchical in nature where which forms the entities or uh, the nodes can be in uh, hierarchically uh, related to one another. Right? If you look at the search applications, there might be some of these domain ontologies that are present that can provide uh, extra useful information for us to be able to uh, use this knowledge into the deep learning architectures. If you look at the product search catalogs, there's a lot of information that are that shows the relationships between these items that are available. And we want to incorporate that information when we are trying to learn these embeddings for this uh, in, in these uh, downstream applications that are related to this search problem. In, in natural language processing, we would want to use these hierarchical relations between the words in a sentence, which is given by the syntax tree that you are seeing uh, over here in the right-hand corner. So given this information that is available, if you look at a hierarchical data set that is shown on the left-hand side, the as you increase the depth in the hierarchy, the number of nodes can grow exponentially. In such cases, the Euclidean space is going to have some limitations because the Euclidean space is going to grow only linearly. 
And you will see that this representational volume that is obtained from the Euclidean space is not sufficient. And on the right hand side, we will see we can see the Euclidean embeddings that are kind of representing these points in a clustered uh, manner and not preserving the hierarchical relationships in the data. So moving towards more uh, advanced space than Euclidean space, when we have this uh, hyperbolic spaces, which are non-Euclidean, it can better capture the hierarchical dependencies in the data. As you can see here, the hyperbolic embeddings organize this data in a much more uh, systematic manner where it tries to preserve the hierarchical relationships in the data. The reason why hyperbolic space is able to do that is because it closely resembles the hierarchical structure of the, compared to their Euclidean counterparts. For example, if you see the right-hand side figure over here, you can see that hyperbolic uh, distance between the two points, the blue nodes, uh, is trying to mimic what is the least common ancestor distance in a hierarchical, uh, when it's trying to preserve a hierarchical relationship. So if you look at a real world problem, like uh, trying to uh, build embeddings for a, a publication data set like Quora, where you have the nodes representing these publications and the color is being repre representing the uh, topic of this uh, publication, you will see that when you apply a standard GCN model on this Quora data set, the Euclidean embeddings are uh, kind of cluttered uh, and they are not easily separable, as opposed to when we have this hyperbolic embeddings in a point core uh, model, we will see that the the embeddings are clearly uh, well uh, organized in, in this uh, representation, right? And this is a problem for node classification when we apply the hyperbolic uh, GCN model and it can generate better uh, representations in a, in a more separable uh, manner compared to the standard GCN architecture. We will see a lot of applications like this and how uh, to effectively use this um, uh, hyperbolic models in this uh, tutorial. So keeping all this in mind, uh, the main objective of our tutorial is to create a one-stop shop for hyperbolic networks. We would like to have all the information that is needed to successfully build hyperbolic models in uh, real world applications at one location. So that will be our tutorial website. And we will describe the theoretical underpinnings of hyperbolic geometry. And we will also talk about the architectural design choices and implementation details of how these models can be embedded into a deep learning architecture. And we will describe some of the successful application case studies and which can be made very easily, uh, which were made very easily available through a GraphZoo toolkit, which we'll be presenting even in our demo paper uh, in, in, on Wednesday. And you will see that many of these uh, applications can benefit from a easily adaptable uh, code that is available through this uh, GraphZoo uh, library. In all these applications, you will see most of the times the overarching network structure will remain the same, and there will be some components that would uh, want uh, that needs some change. Most often, you will see that we will need to change the operators from a standard Euclidean operation like wx plus b. We would like to replace that in the hyperbolic space using Gyra vector operations as indicated over here, right? And then we will also show how to change the manifold versions of uh, Euclidean layers to corresponding. Uh, uh, layers in the hyperbolic space using very simple modifications and you really don't need to uh, dig deep into how to make these changes in the hyperbolic space when we have all these interfaces available uh, if you are interested only in the applied aspect of this tutorial. So this is one reason why this tutorial is uh, important for, uh, for you to uh, follow is because you have different components in this tutorial. One, if you're really interested in the math part of it, we do provide some theoretical aspects of uh, uh, hyperbolic networks, including the manifolds and gyro vector operations and some basic uh, models. And if you are interested in algorithmic design, you will be excited about the architectures, different forms of architectures that can be uh, leveraged when you want to handle in hyperbolic space. And if you just want to look at the applied aspects of it, you will see that several applications uh, like graph applications, search and natural language processing will benefit a lot from uh, these hyperbolic models. And you can, uh, so we, our tutorial is divided into these three components and roughly we dedicate uh, anywhere between 45 minutes to one hour for each of these three uh, components in this tutorial. This will be the overall organization of our uh, uh, topics today. Uh, <clears throat> at every point, we are going to talk about how they are, can they are better than their Euclidean uh, counterparts. So dig digging deeper into what each component will look like, 
So he, we provide a detailed taxonomy for each of these components. So starting with the theoretical aspects of hyperbolic networks, we have, uh, we were going to talk about some of the very popularly used manifolds like uh, the Poincare ball and Lorentz model. And then we will discuss the gyro vector operations, including the Mobius operations, Mobius addition and Mo Mobius product uh, operations. And then we will also talk about the exponential maps and logarithmic map, uh, which, in, which are the transformation operations that would need for uh, uh, successfully using the hyperbolic uh, models. And we will also describe some of the distance functions. Towards the end of this theoretical uh, part, we will also describe some of the basic uh, classification and regression models, which will, uh, which will include the hyperbolic multinomial logistic regression model. And we will describe different activation functions. How do we transform that into a hyperbolic uh, activation uh, model. So coming to the second part of the tutorial, we are going to talk about different architectures, starting with a basic hyperbolic linear layer. And then we will describe a little more advanced uh, architectures, uh, namely the sequential and spatial uh, models. And we will have their corresponding hyperbolic variants, hyperbolic recurrent layer and the hyperbolic convolution layer. We will also spend some time on the hyperbolic attention. And finally, we will also have, we will talk about some of the generalized models like pseudo point care, which use hyperbolic normalization to provide a smooth transition between Euclidean space and a hyperbolic space. If the data has hierarchy in it, you will have, uh, you can use the hyperbolic uh, models. And if the data doesn't, then you can uh, transition smoothly to Euclidean space. So in that sense, it is a more generalized uh, model. Coming to the last component of the tutorial, we will be talking about different applications, including the knowledge graph uh, applications, uh, where you have different uh, hyperbolic uh, GCN and the hyperbolic models. And we will also talk about attributed graphs, where if you have textual information that you would want to combine uh, in addition to this graph information, so we have models that can handle this multimodal data, and we will uh, show how, uh, how it can be effectively done in the hyperbolic space. We will also talk about some of our own work on uh, product search, where we have developed a hyperbolic entity model in, um, in, in the Anthem model. And then finally, we will also describe some of the NLP applications, including embedding and uh, question answering applications and the methods like HyperQA and HyperText that are popularly used uh, that leverage hyperbolic models will be described in, in detail. So in terms of the logistics of it, uh, after each component, we will have a question answer session and you are free to ask questions or you can also put it in chat. We will be monitoring chat and we will be describing, uh, we will uh, ask the questions and the speaker will answer these questions. And if you have any feedback about the tutorial, please feel free to uh, use this link and uh, provide us the feedback. This will help us improve the tutorial and make this, uh, uh, this topic more uh, widely ap applicable to other uh, researchers in, in the future. So any questions that you currently have? If not, I will hand it over to Srinivasan Sangamedu, SHS, who will describe the theoretical aspects of hyperbolic networks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Chandan, for providing the motivation for uh, hyperbolic networks and uh, hyperbolic representations. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is, you know, taking over where Chandan left off and make some of the ideas more precise and uh, uh, also give an intuitive feel. I think that's more important than precision. So um, and uh, and just to kind of set the context, uh, like hyperbolic net. Uh, math, the hyperbolic geometry and ideas related to that. People have worked on it for more than 200 years and uh, it forms the core of uh, uh, relativity or the formal part of relativity. So there are a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, deep ideas. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to cover is basically what's relevant to us and uh, also give an intuitive feel rather than be very, very rigorous. Okay. So uh, so again, you know, look at the pictures, get the intuition, ask questions. Uh, I think, uh, and of course, you know, that will start the journey rather than trying to get very precise. Okay. So uh, having said that, uh, uh, this is the outline of my talk, uh, this part of uh, the talk. Uh, first, I will show how hyper objects in hyperbolic geometry look like. Um, and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, things like lines and uh, circles and so on. So that's the first part. Uh, in the second part, uh, get a little more formal. Uh, how do we represent uh, these operations like the standard addition and much, uh, uh, scalar multiplication and all, uh, everything in the hyperbolic world? And the third one will be you know, closer to neural networks, uh, talk about uh, classification, uh, how can it be reformulated in the, in the hyperbolic space and so on. So, uh, so this is the high level outline of my talk. Um, so uh, let's dive into the hyperbolic space and see how it looks like. And the one standard way to look at hyperbolic space is always start with the Euclidean space. Anything we do, like how does the space look like? How do we do addition or multiplication? And then generalize it to that space. So in the same spirit, uh, let me start with the Euclidean space, which all of us are familiar and uh, just reinterpret some of the uh, things we, are, uh, we already know. So there is absolutely nothing new here. So, so in the Euclidean space, for example, you take two points and draw a straight line between them. No surprise. And you take a circle with a unit diameter and the circumference is pi. Uh, still no surprise. Uh, and uh, the third one is a little interesting. For example, uh, if this is all about parallel lines. Uh, I'll put it in a slightly different manner. So let's say you take a line and a, a point not on the line. So then you can draw exactly one line, which is parallel to the original line. So we can actually say, okay, there is one parallel line in the Euclidean space, okay? And uh, finally, you take three points, uh, draw straight lines between them, and uh, what you get is a triangle. And if you sum the angles of the triangle, that is 180 degrees. So this is very well known. Uh, now let's go into the hyperbolic space and see how these things look like. So the most important thing to understand about hyperbolic space is, you know, what you see here, the underlying shape, that is the hyperboloid. And all the objects like points, lines, circles, triangles, everything should lie on the hyperboloid. I think that's the most important thing. So now let's say you take two points on the hyperboloid and you draw a line between them. And this line should lie entirely inside the hyperboloid. So the, whatever is the dotted line, which is the straight line that goes outside the hyperboloid. So that is not admit permitted. So the straight line uh, in the hyperbolic world actually is a curved line, which lies on the hyperboloid. And uh, the second one is if you take a circle with unit diameter and uh, the circumference, we'll see exact you know, expression for this, that's greater than pi. And uh, if you take a line and a point not on the line, you can actually draw infinitely many lines which are parallel to the original line. So this is, you know, you can look at it like there are infinitely many number of parallel lines. And uh, if you take three points on the hyperboloid and connect them through the straight line, which actually looks curved, uh, to the to our eyes, and uh, the and you can actually define angles on this, uh, and the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees. So uh, again, another way to look at it is the triangles in the hyperbolic space are thin uh, in some sense. Okay, so this intuition is going to be very helpful. So that's why I'm just kind of uh, giving the informal picture here. Um, and of course, uh, you can also do similar things on the sphere and the properties are different. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the, all the details. Uh, at the same time, the interesting thing is if you look at a sphere, uh, if you look at a triangle on the sphere, uh, the sum of the angles is greater than 180 degrees. So the sphere is, the, the, or, uh, the, the triangle is some kind of thick. Uh, just keep that, uh, uh, the visualization in mind. So at a high level, the, the way to def characterize these different spaces or the Euclidean space is flat uh, or the curvature is zero, the hyperbolic um, space has negative curvature and the elliptic geometry has positive curvature. So now the question is, you know, what does the curvature mean? Okay, so we'll get to that. At, uh, uh, at the same time, more formally, an n-dimensional uh, hyperbolic space is an n-dimensional complete Riemannian manifold with constant negative sectional curvature. So, so we are going to just expand on the notion of a curvature in the next slide. 
so what you see here is uh, you know, a wiggly line. And uh, uh, one thing you can do to any of these lines is uh, at a, a any point, you can draw a circle, which is just touching that point. Any point on the curve, you can draw a circle, which is just touching that. And uh, obviously, this circle has a radius. So the inverse of the radius is called the curvature. So now we know what the curvature is defined as. And, uh, um, and another interesting thing is, uh, uh, if you draw this uh, uh, circle at different points, you know it can be on two different sides. So that gives you the sign of uh, the curvature. So here, the curvature is negative. So, uh, so when we say hyperbolic space has constant negative curvature, so it, you know it looks locally like this, and uh, of course generalizing it to other dimensions. So this is a, a surface with a negative curvature, which is hyperbolic. This is a surface with a zero curvature, which is flat, and this is a surface with positive curvature. And uh, a, a very interesting thing to note is this, some of these ideas do carry over to network objects or discrete objects. So I think that's a very powerful idea. So if you look at uh, this uh, graph, for example, this has negative curvature, we can see you know, how these are defined. And uh, you can see that you know, this has some kind of a hierarchical structure. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, flat, uh, grid and this has zero curvature and this is a completely connected graph which has positive curvature. So, so again, you can start having the intuition that there is a notion of a curvature which applies to multiple objects and uh, this is somehow related to uh, the notion of a hierarchy. So we are going to make all these uh, things more precise. Uh, so there are several things one can do, th things like uh, uh, you know, given a data set, we can estimate the curvature, we can learn the appropriate curvature and so on. And there are multiple measures for this. So, uh, so, so let's go to the other notion, which is important in uh, the hyperbolic geometry, which is the notion of a geodesic. And, uh, and here, uh, this again is a kind of a familiar notion in the context of graphs. So if you take a graph, the shortest distance between two points, which lies entirely on the graph, uh, is some kind of a geodesic. And uh, what we would like to do is we would like to kind of uh, generalize it to uh, the continuous space. Uh, so if you look at uh, the sphere, uh, you take two points on the sphere. So this is the shortest distance uh, between the two points and that that is a geodesic and that is on a great circle and uh, and if you take uh, a manifold like this uh, and you take two points on the manifold uh, you know this is the euclidean uh, uh, distance which is not completely on the manifold and uh, the 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 geodesic goes inside the manifold and looks like that Okay, so so again, this is going to be an uh, uh, important idea which we are going to uh, see again and again. And uh, as I said, it's some kind of shortest distance uh, between two points. And uh, geodesics are generalizations of uh, straight lines uh, in the uh, in the Euclidean geometry, and uh, and uh, more formally, they are uh, constant velocity curves which are uh, locally distance minimizing. Uh, and uh, the thing to just keep in mind is the notion of a velocity, which is going to be kind of important. Uh, we, we are going to uh, come to that a little later. Okay, so uh, so with all the background about uh, the distances and geodesics and so on, uh, what is a hyperbolic space? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, hyperbolic space uh, is. Uh, is a space where all the objects lie, let's say, in this high hyperboloid, um, and uh, uh, and of course, you know, this is a, a reasonably complex object to work with. Uh, so what people have done is uh, people have uh, kind of simplified uh, the representation. At the same time, these representations are equivalent. So let's look at one such a representation. Uh, so this is the hyperboloid, and what you can do is uh, you can take it unit disk, uh, which is at the origin and project 
each point on the hyperboloid to the unit disk uh, and the point of projection is at minus one uh, on the vertical axis. So uh, each point on the hyperboloid is mapped to a point on the unit disk. And uh, as we saw earlier, so this is a line uh, in the hyperbolic on the hyperbolic sheet. And if you take the projection, it, uh, it looks like an arc uh, uh, inside the circle. So, uh, and the, the, this represents, this is completely isometric or equivalent. You can go from one point in e, any, any of the objects to the other object. So this is one representation of the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic sheet. And uh, th there is another representation in which, which is kind of similar uh, uh, in the sense there is still a unit disk. And uh, in this case, the disk is just touching uh, the sheet uh, and uh, the point of projection is uh, the origin. And, uh, and of course, you take a line here and project it on uh, to the disk. Uh, in this case, it looks like a straight line. Uh, uh, you know, visually, it's a straight line. So, uh, so this is these are the two representations, and uh, you know, these are the the Poincaré disk and the Klein disk are uh, two popular representations of the hyperbolic space, and uh, they are isometric in the sense uh, the distances are preserved. Uh, so, when we look at just now, we spoke spoke about distances, and we'll see you know what that means. So. Uh, this is these are the two uh, the Poincaré disk and uh, the the Klein model in greater detail. So so these are the three different uh, or the four different lines in this uh, uh, in these spaces. Uh, and uh, uh, the the thing about uh, the Poincaré disk is it is conformal or it preserves angles. So it is uh, good for uh, visualization, especially and. Uh, uh, the visualization so, so you saw earlier from Chandan, you know, that was on the Poincaré disk. Uh, I, and uh, this one, uh, the Klein model, uh, it preserves convexity. So if you're doing any kind of uh, uh, aggregation or a convex combination, uh, this is uh, very helpful. This is more numerically stable. And uh, for example, if you're doing attention, you're kind of combining uh, different vectors in some sense, and you know this is a good space to work on. So while we saw two different spaces, uh, the, each of them has a different a specific role in uh, what we do. Okay, and uh, 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 so uh, now that we have seen. Okay, hyperbolic space is a good space for representing hierarchy and uh, how it looks and some of the intuitions. Uh, what we would like to do is we would like to kind of develop neural networks in this space. And uh, when we talk about neural networks, uh, what are the things we typically do? Uh, for example, we calculate distances between points, angles between vectors. Uh, we do vector addition, we multiply, you know, we do scalar multiplication, we do matrix multiplication and so on. Uh, things like applying a nonlinear function, which is typically the activation function, uh, do things like classification and so on. Okay, so, so these are the typical operations and uh, uh, what we would like to do is we would like to develop a formal uh, a description of these operators in the hyperbolic space. So, so that's going to be our, uh, the, the, uh, that's how the journey is going to continue. Um, and uh, so let's look at the most fundamental aspect uh, in any space, which is the notion of a distance. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we saw earlier that how the circumference varies and so on. So one of the most fundamental things is the volume of a ball uh, increases exponentially with respect to the radius. Uh, for example, if you take the circumference of a circle that is given by this expression, which is exponential in the radius uh, of the circle. So this is what uh, Chandan alluded to earlier, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, both the areas and uh, the circumference and volumes, they, they increase exponentially with respect to that. 
And if you look at a, a tree, the number of nodes at any given level, that's exponential, which is like the circumference and the total number of nodes is also exponential, which is like the area. So if you look at the Euclidean space, the Euclidean space does not have enough capacity to represent uh, an object like tree because uh, it is still you know, polynomial or quadratic. Uh, so, so this is an example of embedding a tree on the Poincaré disk. We saw the, what the Poincaré disk was earlier. And uh, so this is the embedding of a tree and uh, any line segment you see here is, uh, you know, uh, one link in the tree. Uh, so uh, if you look at each of these lines, they seem to have different lengths, especially towards the circumference, the lengths are smaller. So the important thing to note is all the uh, line segments have exactly the same length. Uh, you know, what you see as a shorter length towards the circumference, that is because of the projection. So let me give a, uh, an intuition to that. So let's go back to the hyperboloid and uh, let's say that we draw a unit uh, uh, length line segment somewhere here and project it uh, on the disk, because what we see is the object on the disk and it's going to have certain length. And now let's take exactly the same uh, unit length uh, line segment at somewhere higher up in the hierarchy and project it to the disk. And uh, first thing is it's going to be closer to the circumference and it's going to have a much shorter apparent length. So that's exactly what you're uh, seeing here. Uh, um, these lengths appear smaller at the same time, uh, they have exactly the same length. And uh, this is kind of formalized by what's called the Riemannian metric, which is defined at each point on, uh, on the circle. And uh, this is the form of that. And uh, if, for example, if X is zero, uh, this is two. And if X is close to uh, uh, one, this kind of blows up. And uh, so this one is the actual local scaling factor. And uh, if you look at the Euclidean geometry, this uh, metric is the identity. So, uh, so, th so this is a more of formalization of, uh, you know, the hyperbolic space having enough capacity to represent objects. So the main uh, takeaway for this is, uh, so if you are representing a hierarchy, uh, you can uh, the use, the radius to capture the depth and uh, uh, things kind of uh, fall in place. So that's the main uh, takeaway. So this is uh, an example of uh, another example in addition to what Chandan showed, uh, 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 you know, visualizing a data set on the Poincaré disk. So here the data set is the disease data set. Uh, this captures uh, disease propagation. It's a synthetic data set. So what you can do is you can take a, a graph convolutional network using Euclidean representation, train the network for link prediction and uh, plot it. And uh, this is how the different representations uh, uh, line up. And uh, you, it's, it's a little hard to see the underlying tree structure. At the same time, you take the same network and uh, run it through a, a hyperbolic graph convolutional network and uh, plot the node embeddings. And uh, of course, here you can see the, the apparent tree structure more, and it is kind of closer to the theoretical one we saw earlier. So, so, so this does show that hyperbolic space has enough capacity and it, uh, it preserves all the kind of intuitions and so on, okay? So now that we have seen, uh, this is a good space to work for hierarchical objects. Uh, let's see how we do formal operations. So far, whatever we saw was a little more uh, intuitive um, uh, and uh, pictures. So let's get into some kind of equations. And uh, we always start with the Euclidean space. Uh, so, so this is the Euclidean space. And let's say we take three points, X, Y, and Z, and there are two line segments. And how do we represent them? Uh, we represent using what's called the vector space model. Uh, so the lines, so X, Y, and uh, uh, Z, these are all vectors. Uh, so this line is represented as X plus Y minus X times T, where T is a scalar. And uh, if it is between zero and one, you get this finite line segment. If it goes uh, infinite to infinity on both sides, you get the full line, for example. 
right? And uh, you can define the angle uh, in this manner. Um, you can uh, uh, you can actually represent these through vectors, um, and uh, you can also you also have the notion of uh, distance. So this is the standard uh, familiar uh, vector space uh, model for uh, Euclidean geometry. So now let's see how uh, this pans out in the in the hyperbolic space. And uh, it, uh, earlier we talked about uh, two different models, the Poincaré disk and the Klein model. And here again, you can draw, uh, you can take three points and draw lines and so on. And of course, you know, they look different for the reasons we mentioned, right? So now, uh, how do we represent uh, this? So I, I'm going to give a high level picture and get into some more details uh, later. Uh, the notion of a line in, in the hyperbolic space, that's called uh, a, a gyro line. And uh, uh, x, y, these are all you know, gyro vectors and uh, the, the line is represented as x. So this is the gyro vector addition. Uh, so, so this is uh, the the additive inverse. This is the scalar multiplication. So, uh, the 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 objects are different in the two spaces. At the same time, the vector space representation remains the same. And uh, you know, we'll get into some of the uh, details of this in the next slide. So, uh, the high level takeaway here is um, uh, we use. Uh, the gyro vector space formulation to represent objects uh, uh, in this space, and uh, uh, this looks similar. Uh, this is this consists of gyro addition, gyro scalar multiplication, uh, which are sh shown in uh, these, you know, O plus and uh, uh, the, the, the 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 multiplication operator, and uh, this looks uh, similar to the Euclidean operations at a high level. Um, uh, so these are the you know the algebraic counterparts of geodesics, and now the question is you know how how do the closed form expressions look like? Okay, so now let's get into uh, a little more detail. So this is what we saw earlier: uh, the the lines uh, in on the Poincaré disk, uh, uh, gyro lines uh, apply to anything, and uh, the, so this is the angle between the two line segments x and y. And uh, uh, so this is the vector representation of the line, and this is the length of uh, uh, the line. Okay, um, so uh, so this one kind of looks uh, similar to the uh, the standard vector space representation. At the same time, you know there are a lot of uh, nuances, like uh, these operations are not commutative or associative in the usual sense, and people handle them in interesting manners. So we will uh, uh, we'll skip those details. Uh, and uh, uh, so we talked about the zero vector representation. Now, of course, you know our goal will be to kind of get uh, you know more close form expressions for these. So if you look at uh, if you look at the vector addition here, uh, it's going to look like x plus a is you do the component wise addition, for example, and you know how to get uh, the, the the result. So how do we do that in the hyperbolic space? Uh, so and you know this depends on the underlying space. For example, on the Poincaré ball, we use the notion of the Mobius transformation uh, to do these operations more specifically. So x is a vector or a gyro vector, a is another vector, and this is the you know the x plus a on the Poincaré disk, and uh, uh, what is Mobius transformation? Uh, the Mobius transformation uh, is represented. Uh, it is it's originally originated in uh, complex analysis, so it looks like this. And uh, if you rewrite it in the form of uh, the vector space operations, so it's it, it kind of looks like this. So. Uh, so the addition of uh, x and a, uh, it has this uh, closed form uh, on the Poincaré ball. And of course, you know, if you move to the Klein, it's going to have a different representation. Um, uh, and uh, you can do the subtraction, or you can define the subtraction in the same manner. 
And uh, the interesting thing to note is uh, C is the curvature of the space. And uh, even uh, C goes to zero, you recover the standard uh, Euclidean addition and subtraction. So, uh, so this is uh, kind of compatible with the definition, uh, the, the well-known definitions. And uh, the scalar uh, product or the scalar multiplication is defined as a repeated addition. Uh, and you can take limits and so on. Okay, and even here, uh, when the curvature goes to zero, you recover the standard uh, Euclidean scalar multiplication. Uh, so, so what we have done so far is uh, we have uh, defined uh, uh, the you know uh, Mobius operations on the Poincaré ball. And uh, we have closed form expressions. Uh, now the question is, uh, how do we do this on a general Ramanian manifold? Uh, and uh, one uh, nuance here is a general Ramanian manifold does not have a coordinate representation. You cannot say x1, x2, and so on. Uh, for that, we heavily uh, leverage the notion of a tangent space. Uh, so let's look at uh, this. Uh, manifold here, and uh, what we would like to do is, uh, you know, it's a complex object, and uh, we saw some of the projections, and uh, here we look at another representation, which is uh, what's called the tangent uh, plane, or the tangent space. Uh, so what the tangent space consists of is, it consists of all the velocity vectors. Uh, um, or so, and uh, so for example, let's say P is a point on the manifold, you can uh, draw any number of curves passing through P and uh, each of these curves has a velocity. Uh, so this, the space of all velocities is what's called the tangent space. And uh, this is a vector space because you can add velocities and you do get a velocity as an output. So, uh, so what is a tangent space? It's some kind of a, a Euclidean representation, a local Euclidean representation of uh, the manifold. And, uh, and obviously one thing you would like to do is you would like to kind of uh, move between the manifold and the tangent space. And uh, this is done through what are called the, the exponential map and the logarithmic map. Uh, so what the logarithmic map does is it moves from the manifold to the tangent plane and uh, the exponential map moves from the tangent plane to the manifold. So, so how do we do that? Uh, for example, let's take the exponential map. So what it does is it moves from the uh, tangent plane to the manifold. And uh, we saw earlier that uh, tangent plane consists of velocities. So let's say P is your point and uh, this is the tangent plane and uh, V is a member of the tangent plane, which is a velocity. So uh, what you do is you start at P and uh, move on the manifold with this velocity for unit time and wherever you end up, uh, that is your mapping. So that is your tangent uh, that is the uh, log, that's the exponential operator. And uh, the inverse is the logarithmic operator. So uh, the, the summary is uh, the tangent space is a Euclidean space and it does admit uh, some kind of a coordinate representation and uh, you can move between the manifold and the tangent space. Uh, through this exponential and uh, the logarithmic maps, right? So this simplifies the representation and uh, all these ideas are going to be used very heavily uh, going forward. Um, uh, so for example, let's say that, you know, we saw the scalar multiplication where you take a vector uh, or point in the manifold and multiply it through a scalar multiplication, through a scalar, uh, the, the way of doing the same thing using the tangent plane is you take uh, this point, you project it to the uh, tangent plane through the logarithmic operation and do your scalar multiplication uh, uh, in the tangent plane and then map the result back to the manifold through the exponential operation. So, so this is another way to do that. And this kind of generalizes even to matrix 
multiplications and so on. So, uh, so this is going to be a very crucial uh, uh, way to uh, do operations. Uh, uh, the tangent plane is a very important uh, uh, object in which you do all your manipulations. And uh, so uh, this is another example where uh, you want to take a point on the manifold and do some kind of a nonlinear operation like uh, applying an activation function. Uh, so here again, the recipe is map the point to the tangent space, uh, do your operation and map it back uh, to the manifold. So, so this is uh, how you do uh, uh, an activation function. If you want to do an aggregation, let's say you have a set of points on the manifold. Uh, so uh, all these things are done in, uh, in the tangent plane. Um, and, uh, you know, things like distance functions are uh, kind of defined in the standard uh, manner. Uh, so another very uh, important concept is the notion of a parallel transport. So, so here, let's say that you have a vector or some kind of a direction, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, VA at point A on the manifold. And now the question is, what is the corresponding object at point B on the manifold? Uh, is it exactly some kind of a Euclidean translation or is it something moving along the manifold? So if you do the standard Euclidean translation, you end up with this vector or this velocity. And if you do something more appropriate on the manifold, you get to this. And uh, uh, so this one seems more reasonable because it is uh, inherently tight to the manifold, and that's exactly what the parallel transport does. Uh, it's it's a way of moving uh, inside uh, uh, the hyperbolic uh, space, uh, respecting the geometry, and uh, more formally, it maps uh, the tangent space at one point to the tangent space at another point. And uh, we'll see, you know, why this is uh, important uh, in, in just a bit. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's say that you, so the, there is a point uh, a velocity vector v at point uh, belonging to the tangent space at point y, and you'd like to move it to the tangent space at point x. Uh, so, so basically what you do is uh, uh, you do the exponential operation, uh, map it to the manifold, uh, then uh, you do you take that and move it along the geodesic uh, and uh, then uh, you ma move it back you ma map it back to the tangent space using the logarithmic operator uh, so uh, so this is uh, the notion of uh, uh, of uh, the parallel transport and uh, one very common application of this is uh, the application of bias uh, in neural networks. Uh, uh, we, we always do this X plus B where B is a bias. And uh, this is done uh, through the, 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 the parallel transport uh, mechanism uh, where you, the bias is, in this case, you know, let's say this is the hyperbolic bias, you map it to the tangent space, uh, do the parallel transport and get it back to the manifold uh, through the exponential operation. So, uh, so this is uh, this is an important uh, idea. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the other bit is about uh, uh, how do we do logistic regression or a multi-class logistic regression in the hyperbolic space. So, if you look at the progression, we started with representing points, vectors, doing operations on them, um, and uh, uh, and going between that, uh, you know, the manifold and the tangent space through uh, exponential and logarithmic maps. And uh, we'll use some of these ideas in defining the logistic regression. So if you look at the Euclidean uh, logistic regression, let's say there are many classes and uh, the probability of an object, uh, a point X belonging to class K is given by this expression. So this is very well known. And uh, one thing that may not be so well known is we can uh, rewrite this uh, expression as this, uh, which has uh, three parts. Uh, 
so first of all, this defines uh, some kind of a hyperplane, which is uh, shown here. Uh, so this is the hyperplane corresponding to class K and you have a point X. So first thing you do is you find the distance between the point and the hyperplane. And you also find which side of the hyperplane it lies, the, that gives you the sign. So you first find you know, which side of the hyperplane it, uh, the point falls into, you find the distance between the point and the hyperplane and also some aspect of the hyperplane itself. So, so this gives the probability of uh, a point belonging to class uh, K and uh, here you can actually do a little bit of an algebra to you know, rewrite the same formulation. Uh, so I'll not go into the details. Um, and uh, the, the summary is uh, ML, uh, the logistic regression in Euclidean space is defined by hyperplanes and the probability depends on the distance uh, from the hyperplane and the side of the hyperplane it lies in. And uh, now what we would like to do is we would like to kind of generalize the same idea here. And uh, uh, so let me kind of go over it visually before uh, going into the equations. So, so here you see uh, the hyperbolic space and uh, what you see in green is the hyperplane. Uh, and you saw a line looks like an arc. So the hyperplane also looks like a kind of a curved object. And uh, so this is the point, and uh, this is the kind of the perpendicular distance between you know the point and the hyperplane. So the same idea is captured uh, more formally in these equations. Uh, so so this one basically gives the probability of uh, this point belong uh, belonging to that class. And of course, you know if you if you've got k classes, you're going to have uh, K hyperplanes. So, uh, and uh, this one uses all the notions we have used before in terms of, you know, the, you know, the zero addition and uh, so on. Uh, so, so this is the generalization of uh, uh, multi-class logistic regression to the, to the, uh, the to the Poincaré ball. And uh, uh, the last thing to note is about the, the Riemannian optimization. Uh, so here uh, we have an objective function defined on the manifold. So what you see here is the manifold. And uh, uh, what we would like to do is we would like to do the gradient descent on the manifold. Um, so if you take a point X and take the gradient, uh, the gradient actually lies in the tangent space. And uh, ideally what you would like to do is uh, you would like to move on the manifold. You don't want to go outside the manifold. So, so here again, we are going to use all the operations uh, we discussed earlier. Uh, so let's start with the standard uh, Euclidean, uh, sto uh, the sto stochastic gradient descent in the Euclidean space. You are at a point X and let's say GT is the gradient. So you take a small step in the direction opposite of the gradient. So this is the standard Euclidean, uh, the STD in the Euclidean space. Uh, in the Riemannian, uh, in, in the hyperbolic space, we do similar things. The first one is you take the gradient, uh, then uh, you do it to project it to the tangent space and uh, you take a step uh, in, you know, a small step in the negative direction. And uh, uh, the, so the step is in the, uh, in, in the uh, tangent space. And uh, what you'd like to do is as I said, you know, it's something like a velocity. And after taking the step, you'd like to map it back to the manifold. And that is given by the, the exponential map. So, so this is the Euclidean version and this is the Riemannian counterpart. And uh, you can see that it uses the notion of an exponential map. And uh, several times uh, we may not have a closed form expression for the exponential map. Uh, so people approximate it using what's called the retraction map, which is basically a projection to the, uh, to the hyperbolic space. 
so so this is the notion of the uh, the sgd and uh, uh, obviously uh, people do these adaptive gradient descents and uh, these uh, approaches also do coordinate wise updates and uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, we don't uh, represent points using coordinates so it becomes a little tricky uh, the standard trick here is to decompose the manifold into n sub manifolds uh, and uh, do this uh, update in each of the sub manifolds so the updates are done manifold wise and not coordinate wise because coordinates are not defined at the same time the functional forms look very similar to uh, the the one in the euclidean uh, geometry uh, so so this is a quick kind of a detour uh, i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here at the same time i wanted to bring the the parallels between uh, uh, representing uh, you know doing hyperbolic geometry defining curvature in the continuous space versus the discrete space uh, one of the things i mentioned was the triangles in the hyperbolic space look thinner and uh, we can actually take this and uh, uh, formalize uh, you know a couple of notions one is called the gromo hyperbolicity the other one is called the uh, ricci tensor which are basically based on the notion of thin triangles and uh, generalize them to graphs okay so uh, so again this, I, i'm going very fast here uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is uh, we can use the notion of a Ricci curvature for finding communities in graphs. Uh, since uh, I, I'm kind of out of time, yeah, you, you know, we can take it up offline or you can look it up. So this is uh, an interesting idea. At the same time, this is not related to uh, neural networks per se. So, so in summary, uh, uh, the the thing is you know we have a whole range of uh, things that are defined on the euclidean space for example the notion of uh, distance uh, which is flat in the euclidean space uh, at the same time you know this depends on where you are uh, and that is captured by the metric tensor um, and the notion of a geodesic which is a straight line in the euclidean space and uh, the line uh, or a circle or, or an arc of a circle in the hyperbolic space uh, the 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 formal representation of the euclidean space is the vector space representation while it's called the zero vector space and it has uh, many kind of a similarities uh, to the uh, to the vector space representation and uh, the uh, the standard operations of addition subtraction and so on uh, we perform in this space and if you do it on the Poincaré ball we have the Mobius versions of this and uh, uh, we approximate or we represent the manifold locally through a tangent space and uh, uh, this is very helpful for doing things like you know activations and matrix multiplications and so on and the standard recipe is you move from the manifold to the tangent space uh, uh, and do the operations in the tangent space and come back uh, to the manifold uh, using the exponential operation, for example. So, uh, so that is the standard recipe for working in these spaces. And the, there are uh, things about uh, uh, distances uh, uh, in the hyperbolic space. And uh, there is a generalization of the multi-class logistic regression. The intuition pretty much remains the same in terms of hyperplanes and distances. Uh, at the same time, the details are different. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the workhorse of uh, neural networks, which is the stochastic gradient descent, uh, that also can be generalized to the uh, Riemannian space. Uh, so, so that's pretty much uh, in this part. And uh, in the next part, uh, uh, Nurendra is going to be using these ideas in constructing uh, hyperbolic neural networks and also show a lot of code. So uh, I will stop here and uh, uh, for questions.
other questions? Should I read the chat? Nuradra, if you are speaking, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if there are any uh, questions, uh, please uh, raise them up. And uh, also, uh, please provide your feedback at uh, this link for our tutorial. It will help us in the future versions that we present. And it, yeah, so please uh, provide a feedback for the tutorial there. I think we can wait another minute for questions, and if not, we can okay. just uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, I have a question. So thanks for the slides, by the way, it's very clear. Um, I have a question because I've been training our public neural networks now for uh, some years and, and there is what we call the NAND value problem and uh, I don't know if you have a theoretical background on this uh, how to solve these NANDs because when you're using like the exponential map you can reach like with gradients very big values I mean if you're not using big plots or plot 30, uh, 64 you're quickly like uh, uh, getting NANDs in your training so do you have some I don't know tricks or stuff like that uh, yeah, so in the, I mean, we're going to uh, provide uh, an overview of the uh, toolkit that we provide with this tutorial. And in that, we actually have some uh, clamping functions embedded so that uh, you can, uh, you know, kind of remain in the hyperbolic space and not end up with man values while you're training. Yeah, but so that's the, kill, yeah, yeah. that kills the gradient in a way. I mean, when you're clamping values, you're kind of cheating in a way, like it's just, Canceling the the gradients of uh, those positions. Uh, yes, that is true. In the current interpretation of the Poincaré ball that we have seen, uh, we are uh, I mean we are losing out on gradient information. But again, in the next module, we'll have some alternate in, uh, interpretations where we are like where we are able to see these gradients and uh, work in both the Euclidean and hyperbolic space to make sure that we don't have to clamp and end up with nine values. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, thank you a lot for the time. question. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So this is, this is a very interesting question. And uh, at least the, you know, the theoretical take on that is going to be the client space is more numerically stable than the Poincaré's ball. So, so I I I'm, I think you know there is still some research to be done in uh, uh, in you know leveraging other representations which are more numerically stable for some of the operations we do. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> uh, all right. Uh, so we'll move on to the the next module. So uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Srinivasan, uh, for your uh, take on the theory aspects of the hyperbolic neural networks. So well, hyperbolic, uh, I mean, as you could have uh, seen that the theory of hyperbolic neural networks is extremely vast, and it would probably take multiple graduate courses to cover it anywhere near uh, a comprehensive version of it. But uh, I mean, in this module, what we're going to look at is how uh, uh, how only a specific part of the hyperbolic space is necessary for us to implement it. We'll look at some uh, basic principles and implementation techniques uh, that we are uh, that we actually need to uh, implement the hyperbolic neural networks. And it is only a very uh, specific subset of the hyperbolic uh, networks theory. So in the architecture section, first we'll understand the basic principles like the manifolds. And then we'll look at uh, variants of the layers, uh, like the linear hyperbolic layer or the sequential uh, recurrent layer and the spatial hyperbolic attention and convolution layers. We'll also look at some alternative interpretations, which will answer some of the theoretical uh, problems with the Poincaré space. And yeah, so we'll look at all of those uh, in the order. 
so let's start with the functional requirement for adopting a space into neural networks. Like we had seen in the last module, uh, we only require the operations of addition, scalar multiplication, matrix multiplication, distance metric, and uh, an equivalent of applying an activation function in the hyperbolic space and a softmax variant uh, or an MLR. And we were able to answer all of them in a closed form solution in the previous module. So uh, we have developed a toolkit uh, called GraphZoo in which we actually uh, have support for all of these through an API, uh, through a set of APIs. So the first uh, basic step in designing a hyperbolic neural network is to design its manifold. That would depend on the kind of space that you're using, whether it's the Poincare ball or the Lorenz model or some other, uh, some alternative implementation uh, interpretation of the hyperbolic space. Next, we would want to design some activation functions that we would, uh, that would be problem specific and then design the layers, optimizers, loss function, and then finally integrate all of them into a model architecture. So GraphZoo is, uh, supports both uh, the CPU and uh, GPU running of uh, the models. And on the back end, it uses PyTorch and NetworkX uh, due to their flexibility. And uh, so the uh, Gravzo provides an architecture where we could uh, uh, provides a set of APIs that can uh, basically replace your Euclidean uh, layers, uh, Euclidean layer APIs that we generally get from PyTorch, and then use it for the specific model design uh, problem that you have at hand. The example tasks that we have on GraphZoo are designed for uh, node classification and link prediction, but they can easily be extended for other problems such as graph clustering or any other uh, hyperbolic network problem. So uh, in this part of the tutorial, we'll first understand uh, two manifolds, the Poincare ball and Lorentz, which is also called the Klein uh, model. Then we look at the activation uh, function, which is a general hyperbolic activation function. Then we look at uh, how to use the hyperbolic distance as our loss function. Uh, for the uh, optimizers, we have SGD and IDEM. For the layers, we'll explain the linear recurrent convolution and uh, attention, the hyper hyperbolic variants of those. And then we'll try to combine them into a full-fledged model architecture. So, uh, for designing a manifold, the first step is to define a manifold parameter. Uh, a manifold parameter is basically the equivalent of a tensor, but in the uh, hyperbolic space. So this defines the manifold type, whether it's the Poincare ball and also the curvature of that ball. Or let's say it's the Lorentz model, the curvature of the Lorentz model. The second one is the distance function, which defines the function. Uh, for the hyperbolic distance. So how do we calculate the distance between these two points in that particular manifold? Next, we have our E grad to R grad function, which basically transforms the Euclidean gradient to its Riemannian version, so that we are able to back propagate efficiently. Next, we have the exponential and logarithmic maps, uh, which define the uh, function for exp uh, exponential map from the tangential space to uh, to the manifold and also uh, we have a logarithmic map for mapping the point from the manifold to the tangential space at a point. Next, we have the projections, which basically make sure that our points lie in the particular space that they're working in. Let's say that uh, the same uh, question about clamping is something that is handled in the projections uh, functions. And then we will define the operations, which include addition, scalar product, matrix, and matrix vector product. And also we'll uh, we define the function for parallel transport. Now, these operations in the Euclidean model are uh, pretty simple. Uh, the distance function is an L1 norm. Uh, I mean, you could use anything, but for uh, simplicity, let's say it's the L1 norm. And then we have a parallel transport moving a vector X uh, by, a vector v, which would just be x plus v. And then because uh, Euclidean gradient is, would be the same, it would be p. And then your operations would be simple addition and multiplication. Uh, and for the uh, exponential and logarithmic map, because we are moving the point back to the manifold, it's y minus p. 
and in the second case we are moving the point to another uh, moving the point back to the space at a point v so it's uh, p plus v and the way they are modified into the point carre ball is again uh, uh, we had the closed form solutions. So we just modify the uh, existing implementations and apply these closed form uh, uh, these closed form equations, uh, write them there into the module. And we can just define these functions individually. And they're pretty uh, simple to define in uh, PyTorch. PyTorch already supports all of these uh, functions on, in the base there itself. So, uh, but one point to note is that while these functions were very simple, uh, like uh, in the Euclidean space, we just had addition and multiplication and all of these uh, operations. The functions become extremely complicated in the Poincare space. And this also leads to a problem where we are not able to parallelize uh, the Poincare uh, space. And uh, yeah, several other problems of that sort. And the operations are also very slow. Uh, for example, we see that we are using uh, complicated inverse tangent hyperbolic and tangent hyperbolic operations for doing exponential maps and distance functions. And also the Mobius operations that we have for uh, addition or multiplication are all complicated in their own sense. But uh, in the library, we have provided APIs, which could generally just uh, replace the implementation. You could just use these APIs to uh, uh, do it in your own uh, model architecture and yeah. And similarly, we have defined the same thing for the Lorenz model where uh, we have used the inverse cost uh, hyperbolic like defined in the papers. And they have also been reduced to their API variants which can be used easily uh, in your own implementations. Uh, so activation uh, for the activation function, we know that uh, generally we can operate with any uh, function by just mapping the uh, hyperbolic point to a Euclidean uh, tangent plane and then working on it and then moving it back to the exponential plane. And that is uh, simply what we do in our activation function. And it can take in any uh, Euclidean activation function like ReLU or uh, Sigmoid, anything of that sort and just use it. So we have that. Uh, also implemented as layers or hyperbolic activation, and you could use that in your architecture building. Similarly, uh, we have the RHGD and uh, RADAM modules implemented in the uh, toolkit, where the optimizer function basically moves. Uh, I mean, it uh, moves the hyperbolic uh, delta to the point carry. Uh, first to the tangent manifold, moves the point in the tangent manifold, and then brings it back to the point carrier manifold at the end. And again, we have a simple API uh, which could do that uh, for you. Yeah. So now let's look at how, uh, uh, I mean, how simple it is to actually use hyperbolic, uh, hyper uh, just to convert a regular Euclidean network to its hyperbolic variant. So first of all, we have uh, the simple linear layer, right? It's W transpose X. Let's take three variables, three features, and we have W1, X1 plus, so on till uh, plus P. So all we need to do is replace the multiplication operators with the Mobius uh, matrix multiplication and the addition uh, operations with their Mobius uh, variants. And that's it. And your architecture is now uh, hyperbolic, at least for the linear layer. Now let's look at a recurrent layer, right? So in the simplest formulation of a recurrent layer, uh, it is the same thing as a, it is still a linear combination of the features, but it also takes into account uh, the previous time step. Uh, so the formulation doesn't change by a lot. We only have to replace, again, we do the same thing. We replace the product operations with the Mobius matrix vector operations and the addition operations with the Mobius addition operations. And instead of the regular activation function, we use the hyperbolic variant of the activation function. Now let's look at uh, the example of uh, GRU layer, right? We have the reset gate and the update gate, and they are simple linear combinations. But when we move on to the hidden state uh, for that layer, we see that we now have a element-wise multiplication operator, which is not, uh, 
implemented, I mean, which is not uh, well defined in the hyperbolic space. So uh, in the hyperbolic space, we have, uh, we can use the same uh, properties and have, uh, get the reset gate and uh, update gate values. But for the hidden state and the uh, hidden state updates at that layer, uh, we use Mobius matrix associate, associativity. So the element wise operation that we see here is converted to a mat uh, Mobius uh, matrix vector operation where we use uh, a diagonal matrix of RT to multiply it with HT minus one to get the same end result and make it valid in the Mobius, uh, in the point carry space as well. Similarly, we convert the element wise operations for H of T and uh, using the Diag uh, using a diagonal matrix of the update gate and update the hidden time step at that point. Next uh, is the popular uh, convolution layer. So here we have taken the example of a graph because that is generally where it is uh, most significantly used. So in a graph, uh, let's say we have a target node A and we want to basically aggregate information from all its neighbors like B, C, D. Then we just apply uh, two operations. One is the feature transform, which learns the kind of features or the message that a node is trying to pass to uh, the main root node A. And then we have the neighborhood aggregation uh, where we collect the information that we have received from all these neighbors into the final uh, embedding. So the hidden unit is again, a linear combination. And uh, the neighborhood aggregation is a linear combination again, uh, but it's a summation over all the uh, all the head, uh, all the messages that you have received from the neighborhood. So in hyperbolic space, uh, we just again we all we need to do is apply the matrix vector operation here. But uh, in this case, what we do is we uh, also translate because we have a point where we know that we want to operate, we translate, uh, we transform the input uh, embedding to the uh, tangent space at that point, and then multiply it with uh, a Euclidean weight matrix, and then uh, use the exponential map to bring it back to the hyperbolic space. And again, implementation wise, it is just changing a plus to a Mobius addition and changing matwork to MATMAL to a Mobius uh, matwork operation. For the feature aggregation, uh, we need uh, to have attention of, uh, we want to calculate the attention of node I to node J. And uh, the problem is that in uh, this case, we need the concatenation operation, which is again, not well defined in the hyperbolic space. But uh, we have a golden hammer. We can just uh, project the hyperbolic point to the tangent space, uh, to the Euclidean tangent space at origin, concatenate them, and uh, apply whatever the function we want, which is in this case an MLP, and then bring it back to the hyperbolic space. And uh, that layer, so that is how we calculate the WIJ. And then we aggregate it in the Euclidean space to, and bring it back to the hyperbolic space uh, for the embedding. So implementation wise, it is, we apply, we get all the inputs, we apply a logarithmic map over them, concatenate them after this transformation and apply a linear layer and softmax, and then use an exponential to bring it back to the Euclidean space. So, as a combined pipeline, which is the model that we have, uh, the HGCN model here would work as a feature transform, then we aggregate it, and then we use the activation. So we first uh, have all our points in the hyperbolic space. We move them to the Euclidean space at tangent, aggregate them together, and then apply an activation to bring them back to the hyperbolic space. And yeah, implementation wise, also it's a three step process. Again, uh, very simple because we have already defined the functions appropriately. Next, uh, to look at the attention layer. This is a bit complicated because the concept of a midpoint that we generally use in attention layers 
is not well defined in the Poincaré ball. So a Euclidean attention generally consists of two steps, which is uh, matching, where we calculate the attention weights, and then there's aggregation uh, in the second step. So the challenges that we face here is that there is no direct replacement for softmax in Poincaré ball. And division replacement is not really uh, defined here. And the inner product in the U, uh, and one thing we note here is that the inner product that we see, QI, KJ, is actually, uh, it actually is a distance metric. We want to see how close a query and a key are. And the inner product that we define in the hyperbolic space actually doesn't follow these properties. And Again, so the calc and the next point, the, uh, the calculation of midpoint is also not well defined uh, for the hyperbolic space. So we would like to define all of them uh, to make our lives better. So let's see how we would define the midpoint. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the solution is that we can use the hyperbolic distance for matching. And we can use a client, uh, we can use the client model instead of the Poincare ball model to uh, add to our definition, the definition of an Einsteinian midpoint. And then uh, softmax will be possible because we uh, the client model follows a Euclidean nature and the Euclidean nature of aggregation will enable us to use a softmax uh, over our attention weights. So uh, an Einsteinian midpoint uh, is defined for a client model. So we first define a factor that acts as a weightage for calculating the mean, uh, which is gamma of v. And then uh, we, uh, and all of the points uh, which we basically show in this figure are now a weighted combination of, uh, the, uh, of the points of the triangle. For in the uh, triangle U, P, and Q, we are able to estimate EPV with the Lorentz factor with a weighted combination of the Lorentz factor. And then similarly, we can also calculate EQ, U, and EUP. And then finally, uh, we aggregate them in a centroid, which would basically, again, be a linear combination, uh, weighted combination uh, with the Lorentz uh, factor involved. So uh, this is how we define the matching and aggregation in the attention layer in the hyperbolic variant of the attention layer, we have that uh, we calculate the attention weights for a query and key value. We have an inverse uh, temperature here, which basically uh, lets us uh, define the uh, kind of uh, variance that we want in our data. But uh, I mean, it's a trainable parameter, but you, you generally just uh, set it to a scalar value empirically. And then uh, for the input query and key, we calculate both of these, uh, inverse temperature and hyperbolic distance. And then uh, using those, we calculate the uh, alpha attention weights, uh, which, is the, uh, which, would, which would just be a product of uh, the hyperbolic distance and beta temperature, negate over it and apply an activation uh, for adding nonlinearity. And then in the aggregation step, we are basically uh, using the, uh, we are basically calculating the Einsteinian midpoint from the attention weights and then uh, multiplying it with the value keys that we get to finally get the output of the attention layer. So implementation wise, we have transformed query key and value with the client linear layer, calculate the hyperbolic distance and inverse temperature, which are both defined in the graph zoo toolkit, multiply them and apply a linear layer with bias to get the attention weights. And then in the fourth step, we basically aggregate the attention weights and values uh, using an Einsteinian midpoint to get the final uh, dense representation. So uh, looking at the practical aspects, we see that the weights and biases can lie in either the hyperbolic space or the Euclidean space. And now this brings about the confusion of, uh, of using the optimi right optimization algorithm. So we already always need to be uh, sure that the one that we're using is right for the space that that particular uh, vector lies in. And applying incorrect operation 
can cause instability like the nan issue that uh, uh, was previously mentioned in the q and a session and the exponential maps uh, will transform these features non linearly and hence an activation function may not be needed at all in hyperbolic networks in most cases again uh, and max pooling and batch normalization are directly applicable uh, mean pooling can be derived uh, with gyro vector operations uh, we have the einstein limit point for lorentz manifold so we do not need to define special operations for doing the max pooling or batch normalization we can use the already existing ones in pytorch and they would still be applicable uh, in the hyperbolic network space in some cases uh, we need to use the tangent space at origin but in some cases we need to use it at a different point so the reason uh, i mean why not just convert uh, why not just use the tangent space at origin at all time so the issue with that is that these transformation operations uh, always lead to a loss of information and hence uh, if it is feasible and we know uh, the point of aggregation it is always preferable that we have uh, we perform these operations as close to the point as possible uh but generally that is not feasible like in gradient we never know uh, the relative point where we want to operate and hence uh, tangent space at a point is generally used when there is a source of operation such as root node for aggregation and convolution layers however in most of cases uh, the transformations are applied on singular points like activation functions etc and uh, tangent space at origin is sufficient so uh we have looked at uh, some of the practical aspects of mixing euclidean operations and hyperbolic operations and we have seen that they face uh, some challenges right uh like we have the inverse tangent hyperbolic operation or the inverse uh, or just the tangent hyperbolic operations and we also need to go back and forth from the hyperbolic space to the euclidean space and that always leads to a loss of information and hence uh to solve these issues there have been extensions uh developed in research and in the next session we are going to talk about how uh, hyperbolic neural networks plus plus uh says that we could move everything to the hyperbolic space and that would be good enough and then we have a pseudo poincare framework which basically tells us uh that okay so these are the benefits of hyperbolic space and how can we use the same benefits in euclidean space without going back and forth and losing any information in the process so uh thank you uh that would be the end of this session uh any questions then now hi again i i just looked up the code of graph so, so well the structure is the same than uh, from in semi right from the hyperbolic graph convolutional yes. networks okay. yeah yeah Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah that would be end of this session. Uh, hope to meet you in the next one. Thanks a lot for uh, attending this session. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so in the previous session, we had seen the we had noticed the practical aspects of mixing Euclidean and hyperbolic operations. that we need to move back and forth from the euclidean space to the hyperbolic space through exponential and uh, logarithmic maps which is not always uh, the best way of uh, doing it so uh, recent research has come up with alternative interpretations of the hyperbolic space they try to integrate the benefits of hyperbolic space that we see in uh, representing hierarchical relations and then either try to uh, move all the operations directly to hyperbolic space without the need for the mapping back and forth and then the uh, which is the hyperbolic neural networks plus plus approach and then the second one is that we want to move all the operations that we have uh, into the euclidean space and be able to capture the hierarchical nature as well as we do in the hyperbolic space so to look at the hyperbolic neural networks plus plus so uh, we remember the way we constructed a line was to basically take a point and then move it to the hyperbolic uh, 
explain through a logarithmic, uh, sorry, uh, through an exponential map, and then uh, apply uh, and then form a line around it. So we are basically just moving one point, and then th from the infinitely many lines that we can choose, uh, we just uh, define one which we want to choose. Uh, uh, direct. I mean, uh, we just choose uh, one that satisfies our test case the best. But in this hyperbolic uh, networks plus plus case, uh, what they say is that we know uh, the entire line, and we can basically uh, convert the entire uh, entire line directly into the hyperbolic space, and define uh, that conversion directly instead of actually and just train this line based on the data that we have. And not rely on the uh, mapping forth, mapping back and forth between the hyperbolic space and point carry point. Sorry, uh, hyperbolic space and Euclidean space. So in the point carry ball, uh, we basically define a line. Uh, we have a point, and we basically move it uh, using the exponential logarithmic maps and with the bias. But in the case of hyperbolic neural networks plus plus, we have uh, defined the line and the weight parameter uh, according to the space itself. So we basically uh, uh, train the weights such uh, that they follow this formulation for the uh, space where y equal to, this would be the m and then x. So we directly train for the weights instead of actually just train, uh, which is formulated in this way, instead of just training, uh, for it in the Euclidean space and then converting back and forth. So uh, this work, I mean, I would uh, recommend going deeper into this work if you want to know more. Uh, this work also defines how this space would work for uh, attention layers or uh, convolution layers. And they have uh, properly defined uh, layer operations that you could uh, use if you if we uh, if uh, the loss of information is too much for your specific uh, set of experiments so now uh, let's look at the pseudo point uh, framework so in the pseudo point space we identify that the specific advantage of using hyperbolic space is only the hierarchical relationships so the hierarchical relationships actually lead to an exponential increase in volume and uh, we know that it faces uh, certain practical challenges. So the overall idea is what if uh, we were able to bring this uh, exponential increase in volume into the hyperbolic space, sorry, into the Euclidean space through some uh, formulation. So to that end, uh, here in this slide, I've noted down the challenges that we face in the Poincare space. Uh, the first is that we have non-scalability due to a number of inverse uh, tangent and cos hyperbolic operations. And then we have unstable training and gradient descent is uh, very bad due to skips between uh, hyperbolic and Euclidean space. We also have the problem of non-closure of hyperbolic space. Uh, all points that all vectors in the world are part of the Euclidean space, but not all of them are closed under the hyperbolic space. So we would want to also have a formulation that allows us to skip the hyperbolic space once in a while so that we can do proper gradient descents and not end up with uh, null values. And next that, uh, I mean, these uh, hyperbolic architectures are defined for uh, simple layers right now. We have convolution layer, recurrent layers, but as we move to complex Euclidean architectures such as transformers, uh, the extension will not be trivial. Right, we would need to have uh, functions that are able to integrate multiple uh, layers together to form the transformer architecture. And also there would be a need for additional uh, components such as normalization layers and different optimizers and loss functions that have. Uh, so the field of Euclidean uh, architectures has been well researched. And not all of those modules basically uh, carry forward uh, are carried forward to the hyperbolic architectures. So we would want to also make the extensibility uh, a bit non-trivial. So uh, 
in the pseudo poincare ball framework uh, we use the hyperbolic mapping as a normalization function so what uh, they have realized in their research is that the entire uh, goal or the entire formulation of hyperbolic operations can be reduced to a hyperbolic normalization factor uh, without a significant loss of information so the idea is that uh, you convert all your inputs uh, in the hyperbolic space uh, i mean to the euclidean space at the input and then output you would uh, expand the space expand the representation space to then uh, make sure that your points are not clustered together so in the first figure we see a euclidean space in the next one we see a poincare uh, ball uh, we have representations in the poincare ball and the idea is that we can learn such representations that we have in the poincare ball in the euclidean space itself so for that they have uh, uh, come up with this formulation where a hyperbolic uh, function can be defined as some uh, normalization factor omega of uh, the euclidean architecture that we are working with and just multiply it with the euclidean architecture itself uh, to get the hyperbolic variant of it so n gcn would just be omega of gcn into gcn and n gat would just be omega of gat into gat so uh, uh representationally let's say that uh, we have a set of uh, input hyperbolic points in the previous uh, uh hyperbolic architecture what we used to do was map it back to the euclidean space apply functions there and bring it back to the exponential map and bring it back to the hyperbolic space and then we continue doing this process uh in the architecture in this idea we take the hyperbolic points uh use the logarithmic map move it to the euclidean space have the euclidean architecture run through all the uh, possible uh, needs of the architecture and then get the output and then on the output we apply the normalization function and uh, multiply them together and then get the hyperbolic space directly without the need for so we only have one uh, one place where we need to obtain closure on the hyperbolic space we do not really have to worry about it uh, in each and every layer of the network so so here are some results on uh, graph processing tasks so one point to note is that these uh, normalized pseudo poincare architectures are not just uh, better in terms of uh, you know uh, Uh, computational improvements but they also perform better uh we can see that uh, they perform consistently better in the task of node classification and link prediction and in cases where they don't they are significantly at the level of uh, their hyperbolic equivalents and definitely much better than their uh, euclidean uh, equivalents so uh the reason behind this is that in the normalized uh, i mean in the pseudo poincare space the architectures are not only able to explore the solution subspace of the hyperbolic uh, space but also the solution uh, subset of the euclidean space so our gradient descent will actually uh, obtain weights uh, in the hyperbolic space as well as when the hyperbolic space is not working it will also try to obtain points from uh the euclidean space and this is something we can clearly see from the high performance of ngcn uh, when compared to hgcn in uh, the cora data set uh, for node classification the reason for this is that cora uh, as a data set is a very has a very mixed top, uh, topology it contains some hierarchical information relations in it but it also contains a significant amount of circular relations so uh, the ngcn architecture actually is able to uh, perform better than uh, hyperbolic space because it is able to capture the hierarchical nature as well as capture the circular information from these data sets and another uh, significant point where we found uh, a lot of improvement where the paper found a lot of improvement was in the case of multi relational representations Uh, when working with uh, knowledge graphs we saw that uh, the uh, 
pseudo Poincare version of the multi relational uh, Poincare embedding architecture was able to significantly outperform uh, the Euclidean variant as well as the Poincare variant and give us better performance even with a lower number of embeddings, 40. And even in the case of high number of embeddings, the performance uh, remained, albeit the difference was uh, smaller, which shows that even for uh, even the basic assumption of hyperbolic space that we can represent, uh, we have exponential growth with uh, the number of dimensions uh, stays uh, is uh, also valid in uh, for the pseudo point carry space. Here is a visualization of the uh, uh, of the representation space of GAT, HGAT, and NGAT for the Quora data set. We see that the points in the NGAT architecture are much more linearly, uh, uh, we can easily make a separation margin for the points in the pseudo point carry architecture when compared to the HGAT and GAT variants of the same. And yeah. And uh, this gives us a good uh, visualization of uh, what we are achieving by actually utilizing the pseudo point carry space instead of uh, the basic hyperbolic space and or the Euclidean space in general. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, please ask any questions that you might have and also provide your feedback at the uh, given link here. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Um, Nirendra, uh, what kind of yeah. a normalization you're doing in the pseudo point carry, like on those slides? There's something I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, uh, just after, or this one, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, is it the right one? Uh, are you? Uh, the, is that is the question Omega? Yeah, on the Omega, and also on the slide uh, eighty-one. Mm -hmm. uh, the you have a one a n when you're doing some process. I'm not sure what this is doing compared to the. I mean, I don't know if it's equivalent the operation you're doing here to the exponential and the log map. I mean, the results. Yes. Yeah, so basically uh, what we found was that the entire uh, scope of the hyperbolic operations uh, in all of them, we just have one uh, omega factor, uh, which has all the tangent, uh, I mean, tangent hyperbolic information in it. So all of those, uh, I mean, operations like all of those transformations can be moved directly put in the output. So we do not need to do anything in between. What we could do is log map here and then apply the omega here. So the omega function is actually, a, uh, I mean, it's a nonlinear function that we have defined uh, in, a, in the paper. Uh, that we wrote and we found that this omega factor actually is able to capture the information that we need. Okay, I see. And and then the optimization is done in the Riemannian space. I mean, because you're moving then to the exponential. So I guess you're you're not using uh, SGD, I mean. So uh, I mean uh, so one uh, so we have tried multiple things there. So first one is that, uh, could we like use the, I mean, could we separate the parameters into Fn of X and Omega Fn of X, and then use the, use one optimizer for this uh, solution and then another one for the Omega version of the C, because this will result in uh, two model outputs that, I mean, this won't be done in series. So it will be like yeah. uh, the output goes into, 
two uh, parts and then uh, gets multiplied. So what we found was that like applying a radom here and an adam here is actually better, but uh, the performance gain is not as significant if we just used adam for both of them. But the performance did significantly drop when we used uh, radom for both of them. So Riemannian adam for both of them. Okay. But I, I meant also like the optimization is in the Euclidean space here. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. One part of it is the Euclidean space. Okay. Uh, which I believe is uh, great, right? Because uh, like the null values uh, problem will yeah. be solved with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, so I'll uh, move to the next part. Uh, so next we'll uh, discuss the applications that we have currently seen of these hyperbolic networks in different fields. So first we'll discuss the graph uh, analysis part where we look at some uh, non-attributed graphs which have been solved using HNNs and SGCN. And then we look at uh, knowledge graph architectures uh, like the multi-relational point carry uh, rotational hyperbolic, attention hyperbolic, and then uh, our work, which is the hype paper. And then we we'll look at uh, how we uh, do this for the uh, attributed graphs, which is uh, test GCN later. And then we'll also look at the applications in the domain of search, uh, where we have uh, the Anthem model, which is developed for product search. And then we'll look at its applications in the domain of NLP. So uh, the advantages of hyperbolic networks, as we have previously seen, uh, they are primarily observed in cases when hierarchical relationships exist in the underlying data set. And this is, uh, I mean, uh, such hierarchical relations that exist in several data sets. So if you just look at the WordNet data set here, right? Uh, we have an overarching class uh, like mammal which goes into its subcategories like uh, carnivore, ungulate, et cetera, and then further, uh, or rodent, and then further divides itself into several other categories. So a graph, anal uh, so graph analysis is a definite candidate for uh, hyperbolic networks. And if uh, we don't have a lot of uh, hierarchy in the graphs, I mean, sorry, if we don't have a lot of, uh, relations in the graph, there is a very significant chance that a lot of these relationships will be hierarchical in nature. And we have generally seen a lot of performance improvements whenever hyperbolic networks have been applied to these uh, graph uh, data sets. The second application is on knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs also, they have uh, certain relationships which are circular in nature and several others which are hierarchical in nature. So uh, we also have a metric uh, like hyperbolicity where we can get an estimate of how much hierarchy a particular data set has. And a lot of these knowledge graphs have shown to have a uh, very low hyperbolicity, implying that they actually do have a, a lot of hierarchical nature inside them. Here we have an example of uh, drug repurposing knowledge graph, uh, where we basically uh, understand how genes interact uh, gene proteins interact with what compounds in a particular medicine. And uh, we could use such data, uh, like uh, having link prediction or any node classification on such data sets can actually help us in analyzing, uh, uh, I mean, in recommending new drugs for uh, an existing uh, disease or a new disease. Uh, next, we have search. So here we have an example of the hierarchy we see in product catalogs. We have overarching categories like electronics or movies. And then we have several products uh, arranged in a indexed manner inside them. Uh, while this example is for product graph, most of the search uh, based systems actually do work on such hierarchical indices. And whenever we have such hierarchy, we can uh, possibly use hyperbolic networks. For example, if the data set is, uh, I mean, immense, like millions of nodes in it, then a simple uh, 
I mean, simple binary search or, or tree search would not work as well as let's say learning the representations in hyperbolic networks. And next we have the example of natural language processing. Uh, so linguistics have realized that uh, sentences are always organized into some uh, uh, systematic structure based on parse trees. So here we have the example uh, of a simple sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And it has been parsed uh, syntactically into uh, uh, into a hierarchical uh, into a hierarchical structure where we have a noun phrase. Uh, we have two noun phrases and a verb phrase, and the verb phrase goes deeper into to finally get the tokens at the end of the sentence. So we know that there is some innate hierarchical uh, system involved in the structure of sentences as well. So that is another candidate where uh, hyperbolic networks would perform really well. So in this uh, module, we'll cover uh, the following uh, popular uh, research uh, art uh, articles. For graphs, we'll cover hyperbolic neural networks and uh, hyperbolic graph convolution networks. For knowledge graphs, we'll cover multi-relational Poincare embeddings, uh, low-dimensional hyperbolic uh, knowledge graph embeddings, and then a self-supervised hyperbolic representation model. For search, we'll cover a hyperbolic entity, attentive hy hyperbolic entity model, uh, specifically in this case for the problem of uh, product search. And then for natural language processing, we'll look at hyperbolic representation learning for different problems. So, uh, an introduction to graph analysis. Well, uh, graph analysis are essential uh, structures and they can contain, uh, so they're made up of nodes and edges. Right? And uh, these nodes can uh, contain attributes inside them. And they are connected by edges. So they have some relevance to the nodes that they are connected with. So based on this, there are several uh, popular problems including node classification, link prediction and community detection. We see these graphs everywhere. Uh, we have uh, Cora as the uh, popular citation graph. We saw DRKG, which was a, a example of a knowledge graph. And uh, the problems that we have here, the first one is uh, node classification. Uh, in the task of node classification, uh, we have nodes connected by edges and each node belongs to a particular class. It could be multiple classes or just a binary uh, classification problem, but we want to uh, predict the class for all the other nodes that are not labeled. In the case of link prediction, we have an input graph which already contains some amount of nodes and edges, and we want to predict possible connections uh, that might exist between the nodes and they, which are not already present in the graph. In the case of community detection, we want to understand if uh, a set of connected neighbors actually forms a community or they are just set of individual nodes. So uh, a generic, so graph neural networks actually work on the problem of graph analysis and the generic uh, graph neural network contains three components. The first one is that, uh, for a given target node that we want to learn representation for, we want to select the set of neighbors that we would say pass information or are relevant to this particular target node. For this approach, there are several techniques like uh, the first one is random walk where we just uh, start at the target node and uh, using a random function, just choose one of its neighbors and walk towards it. The second one is deep walk, where we do a breadth first search traversal to a particular depth and take all the nodes as uh, uh, message passers to the main target node. And we also have skip graph, a sp uh, skip walk, where we again traverse the in a breadth first search manner, but we skip some nodes randomly. And next we have message passing. So the way these uh, nodes pass message to the target node is generally uh, defined using a linear layer, a convolution layer, recurrent layer, or an attention layer mechanism. And then uh, once the information is all passed, it needs to be integrated with the target node. And for that, we have functions like averaging, max pooling, uh, a simple MLP, or an attention network. 
So we have uh, already seen HNNs, uh, HGCNs, and edge gats. And uh, let's see how uh, they have been applied to this graph analysis task and the results that we have got from here. So our evaluation tasks are node classification, where we are given a graph with nodes, uh, which could be attributed or non-attributed and edges. And we need to estimate a model that is able to predict the class of unclassified uh, nodes inside the graph. And the next one is link prediction, where again, uh, given the graph with nodes and edges, we want to estimate a model that is able to predict the probability of edges between existing or new node pairs. So here, uh, the data sets that have been considered for this experimental study are Cora, PubMed, Disease, PPI, and Airport. Uh, we have a metric called hyperbolicity, which is a deterministic metric and can be, and is, uh, like we can calculate it from the data set through sampling uh, some points. And the lower the data, uh, the lower the hyperbolicity, the higher the hierarchical nature inside the data set. So from this, we see that the disease data set has the uh, most hierarchical uh, nature among the data sets that we have chosen, uh, that the paper has chosen. And Cora has the uh, uh, most hyperbolicity implying the least uh, hierarchical nature inside the data set. So the nodes in the case of Cora and PubMed are papers, edges are citations, and labels are academic sub areas. And Cora contains machine learning papers and PubMed contains medical papers. Uh, in the disease data set, uh, we are looking at a disease propagation network. We want to see that if a node is particularly, if a testee at a particular infected, uh, how does it propagate to all the uh, all the other nodes that the testee has interacted with. So uh, the edges would be interaction, the labels would be if the node is infected or not. And the description is that, I mean, uh, it simulates a disease propagation model uh, named SIR. Uh, in PPI dataset is a protein-protein interaction dataset in which the nodes are proteins and the edges tell us if the, how the proteins interact with each other. The labels are the stem cell growth uh, rate uh, for that particular protein. And the, dis, uh, and the data set is a union of uh, the PPI networks in human tissues. Uh, the traffic data set, uh, in the area of traffic, we have the airport data set where the nodes are airports and the edges are the flight paths between them. And the labels denote the country's population. And uh, they, uh, the data set is collected from openflights.org. For evaluation, the metrics that the paper has chosen are uh, F1 score for node classification and ROC AUC for uh, link prediction. So from the results uh, here, uh, we see we have two shallow networks as uh, the, uh, as one of the baselines where we have one Euclidean and one hyperbolic shallow network model, which just contains uh, one activation function. Next, we have simple MLP and a simple hyperbolic neural network model. And then we have the more complex uh, convolution networks, attention networks, and uh, the SAGE model uh, to compare against the hyperbolic variants of uh, GCN and HCAT. So we see that Cora, uh, which has a very uh, less hierarchical nature. In this case, GAT is able to outperform the hyperbolic uh, networks. However, in the case where we have uh, hierarchy inside the data sets, we see that HGCN actually uh, is able to perform much better than uh, its hyperbolic or sorry, its uh, shallow neural nets or the just the neural nets or the Euclidean counterparts for it. So we see that uh, given hierarchy, uh, hyperbolic networks are actually able to perform much better than their Euclidean counterparts. Uh, similarly, we see the same uh, performance when we look at link prediction as well, where for Cora dataset, we have GAD, which performs the best. 
but for all the other data sets, we have HGCN that performs better than all the baselines. So uh, a, a set of learnings that we have from our graph analysis task is that hyperbolic space is consistently better at capturing hierarchical structure from more tree-like data sets. So we can calculate the hyperbolicity of the data set and then uh, choose between hyperbolic space and Euclidean space to make a decision over whether to use them uh, for our particular task. And then we also know that hyperbolic networks are able to perform better both on message aggregation, which is a critical part of road classification and message passing, which is a critical part of link prediction. And HGCN and HGAT are also able to reduce the error margins compared to their Euclidean counterparts, which we can see here that the error margins for HGCN are generally much lower than uh, the GCN variant and similarly uh, for HGAT as well. So next we look at the applications over knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs are very simple ubiquitous data structures. They are uh, triplets which have a head relation and tail, uh, which uh, makes them very simple to use for a varied number of tasks. However, uh, querying such KGs is very uh, computationally expensive because they are unordered. Uh, searching over them requires uh, uh, extreme amount of computational uh, resources or uh, computational uh, resources and memory. So, but however, uh, given their ubiquitous nature, they have been applied for several real world uh, scenarios like Amazon's product graph, DBpedia, Freebase, Facebook, Google, and open uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, so imagining these real world scenarios, we see that these data sets generally contain millions of nodes with trillions of relations in between them. And even let's say we order them, we'll still have a logarithmic time complexity to search over them which is not efficient enough uh, for the use case that these uh, knowledge graphs work with. So we found that representation learning can help in such cases. We could learn representations of these entities and relations in the latent space and then apply logical operators to simulate the querying behavior. For a query like Nike and Aldas footwear, we could convert it to something like Nike intersection footwear in uh, Union Adidas intersection footwear and then uh, define the union intersection and uh, such operations uh, to get the best results possible from uh, the representation space that we have for all the nodes in the tree. So the first uh, approach in this area is multi-relational point carry embedding model. So this is an analog to the translational uh, Euclidean representation model. Uh, called Muir. So in the Muir model, we have a head, which is uh, and a diagonal relationship matrix. Uh, we multiply both of them and then compare it against uh, a summation between relation and tail. And our aim in learning the embeddings for head relation and tail is that we want to minimize the distance between RH and R plus T. Uh, so uh, just like we did in the previous cases, uh, the paper, uh, the MERP paper also basically utilizes a logarithmic and exponential map to solve uh, the questions. So we just uh, apply a logarithmic map, convert head to the Euclidean space, multiply it with the relation matrix, and apply an exponential map to convert it back to the hyperbolic space. And then for the relation and tail, instead of using an addition operation, you, uh, they use a uh, Mobius addition operation and try to minimize the hyperbolic distance between the two points to learn the final set of uh, hyperbolic representations. For the evaluation task, uh, the experimental study of uh, comparing MERP against their Euclidean counterparts, uh, we use the evaluation task of relational link prediction where we are given a graph uh, with attributed nodes and the edges here also have attributes and we want to estimate a model that predicts the relevance of other entities as tail answers. So given a query, uh, head and relation, let's say that I want to find uh, all the people located in DC. So my head entity would be DC and the relation would be lives here. 
and i would want to find uh, all the entities that basically are uh, can answer this particular uh, head comma relation uh, query so the data sets that we uh, that the paper has used are freebase and uh, wordnet uh, which contain around 14k and 40k entities respectively and 237 and 11 relationships again uh, respectively uh, freebase is a collection of real world facts that have been collected from the freebase network and wordnet is a hierarchical collection of relations between words and the evaluation metrics uh, that we have uh, that the paper has used for this are hits at 1 3 and 10 which basically tells us that given one particular like let's say that the model predicts 1 3 and 10 answers how many of them uh, is our model able to get correctly and then we have a mean reciprocal rank which uh, gives us an idea of uh, for the given results, are we able to kind of rank them appropriately uh, according to the relevance that they have to the query? Are we able to rank the entities according to the relevance that they have to the query? So we see uh, that MERP is able to outperform all the previous uh, Euclidean counterparts, uh, including uh, Muir, Rotati, Convi, Minerva, uh, neural uh, neural link prediction complex, decimal and transi, and it is able to significantly outperform on both the data sets, which clearly tells us that uh, uh, that I mean that Poincare space is actually really helpful when we have uh, some level of hierarchy in our data sets. So. Uh, this is a visualization of the embeddings learned by Muir and Merck uh, for a 40 dimensional, uh, this, uh, both of them are 40 dimensional Merck and Muir embeddings, and they have been uh, projected to a two dimensional space. Uh, blue indicates true positives and red indicates uh, true negatives. The lighter shades of the color indicate the entity before the relational translation. Uh, one point to note here is that the points are more separable in the Poincare space when compared to the Euclidean space, uh, where they are clustered together. So uh, next we see that uh, these knowledge graphs have a mixed typology, uh, topology, where some of them, some of these relationships could be hierarchical and then some of them are symmetric. For example, Ben Harper married to Laura Dern is a, sym a symmetric relationship. Whereas uh, Jurassic, Park, uh, Jurassic Park featuring Laura Dern is a hierarchical relationship. So we need to come up with an approach that can handle such mixed topology uh, in knowledge graphs. So hence here, the method proposes two sets of embeddings, uh, rotational embeddings and reflectional embeddings. And they are finally combined with uh, attention uh, layer to finally get an attention embedding. So in the case of uh, rotational embedding, uh, we are able to capture the hierarchical nature, whereas in the case of reflection embedding, we are able to capture the semantic nature, uh, sorry, symmetric nature of uh, relationships. Again, the evaluation task remains uh, that of uh, relational link prediction with the same uh, problem statement. <laughs> And uh, we again use the data sets of, uh, they use the data sets of Freebase and WordNet. And they also use the data set of uh, Yago. And uh, uh, again, uh, Yago is a subset of ya uh, Yago3, a large semantic knowledge base that has been derived from Wikipedia, WordNet, uh, GeoNames, and other such data sources. For the evaluation, we again have hits at 1, 3, and 10. Uh, to measure precision and mean reciprocal rank to measure the ranking mechanism. Uh, in this case, uh, we see that uh, for the case of uh, freebase, uh, rotational embeddings actually performs much better uh, than, uh, I mean, rotational Euclidean performs much better than the hyperbolic variants, but hyperbolic uh, models do perform better on consistently perform better on both the other data sets. One reason for this could be that uh, the rotational mechanism uh, made for Euclidean models already is made to capture this hierarchical nature at some level. 
and uh, <clears throat> a hyperbolic space is not uh, always required uh, there. So free base might contain a lot more symmetric relationships, and hence uh, it perform rotational embeddings do perform better in these cases when compared to their hyperbolic counterparts. But uh, for consistent performance on uh, mixed topologies, uh, uh, hyperbolic networks still perform the best, uh, especially the attention model, which captures both uh, hierarchical as well as symmetric relations together. Now, uh, in recent research, what was found that these point-based systems are actually not as good for modeling knowledge graphs as spatial representations. So, uh, here we have the example of a box embedding in Euclidean space. So for a question like from which universities did the Canadian Turing Award winners graduate, we could construct uh, boxes for uh, the head comma relation and then perform operations like intersections or unions to basically give our results. And we know that uh, knowledge graphs uh, such as the product graph do contain inherent hierarchy inside them. And hence we would want to use some hyperbolic uh, Hence, it, I mean, this creates a big motivation for us to utilize hyperbolic space in this arena. So for this, we develop a model, Hype, which uh, takes care of four challenges. The first one is to capture spatial features. Second one is to capture hierarchical features of entities and relations. The next, we want to handle different query types like intersections, unions, or translations together. And then because we don't have any labeled data, we would also want to utilize uh, self-supervised models in this case. So for the translation operation, uh, here is an example of a simple translation operation, which is give all children of a query. So uh, for a query like Nike, we would get all the Nike footwear, uh, sports accessories, etc. And uh, this can be defined with a simple ad uh, addition between entities and relations to get the final hyperboloid. And then intersection gives us the intersection of two queries. Here we have Nike uh, all footwear uh, in the catalog. And here we just have Nike accessories. So an intersection can be the overlapping space between the two, between the query uh, for Nike and footwear to give the final result. And in, uh, in the operation space, it can be the overlap, but it can be modeled as the overlap between two hyperboloids. Uh, a union query gives us the union of two queries. Here we have Nike, Union, Adidas, Intersection, Footwear. So one thing to note here is that uh, the way we model the union actually does not return a hyperboloid in the end. And hence we do not, uh, hence we move all the union queries to the end of our query processing model. And so this can be, uh, we can use the NF transformation to have uh, union over intersection from intersection over union to get uh, answer queries like Nike and Adidas footwear together. So the way the hype model works is that uh, we first initialize the entities and relations with random Euclidean boxes. And then we use a manifold transformation layer to just map them to the hyperbolic space. Next, we have an operator signal here, which tells us whether we want to apply a translation intersection or union between the uh, inputs. And Uh, whether we want to apply an intersection uh, between the units and uh, basically we op operate according to the signal we apply a translation intersection or union according to the signal that we receive and uh, in the next process we want to uh, calculate the loss based on distance of these samples from the query space so uh, we want to calculate the distance of the tail queries that we receive from our answer space. And then we want to uh, make sure that they follow the ground truth. And using the distance operation, uh, we can basically uh, back propagate and update uh, entity and relation representations 
uh, to make sure that this loss, uh, the distance between the query space and the answer space is minimized. So to in, uh, introduce self-supervised learning into the fold, we generate uh, pseudo queries by using the structure relations in the training graph because we do not really have any training data. We just traverse the graph to get the query operations and then use them as pseudo queries to train uh, a representation model. So uh, in the evaluation, we have tested it uh, out on the efficacy of the query search space, performance on an, a downstream task such as anomaly detection. And then finally, uh, we look at a visualization of the hyperbolic uh, representation space. So for the translation operations, uh, for the translation query types, we have 1T, which gives us the 1T, 2, 3, and 3, uh, two t and 3t which gives us the children grandchildren and great grandchildren of the queries intersection which basically tells us the overlap between nike and shoes three intersection would give us the intersection between three entities intersection translation would give us the children of uh, an intersection operation and translation intersection would first take the children and then perform an intersection over the input entities similarly we have two union which gives us the union of the two input entities and union translation, which tells us the children of that particular union. So the task is called uh, logical query reasoning. We use the free base data set, NEL data set, DBpedia, and an e-commerce product graph. The primary baseline we use is uh, query to box, which is an ICLR 2020 paper. And the evaluation metrics are hits at three and uh, mean reciprocal rank. Uh, so from our experiments, we note that uh, Hype is able to outperform query to box across all uh, different types of queries like translation, intersection, union, and compound, and on all the data sets. This uh, is specifically high, like the, this improvement is specifically higher in the case of uh, e-commerce graphs, which we know are hierarchically arranged product catalogs. And next we have our task of anomaly detection, where we want to see that whether a node that has been classified under a parent is a child of that parent or not. Basically, we want to identify if uh, a tail need, should be uh, connected to a relation uh, entity by a, via the relation that it has been connected with it or not. So the evaluation metrics for this are precision recall F1. And we want we consider different levels of parents where we want to see if the parent should be connected or not, grandparent should be connected or not, or the great grandparent should be connected to the child node or not. And in this case too, we see that uh, Hype is able to outperform query to box on the DBpedia data set. And we see that the performance difference is significantly higher as we move to higher uh, parent levels. The first three would uh, tell us the uh, for the level one parent, which is uh, not too much. The second level, we see a higher performance difference for uh, grandparent level uh, study. And then for the third one, uh, where we have the grand great grandparent level study, we see even higher performance difference. Next, uh, to visualize uh, the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic space, we see that uh, these, uh, this is what the hyperbolic hyperboloids of the e-commerce graph look like on the Poincare ball. And this is the hyperboloids of DBpedia. We see a huge intersection here uh, because a lot of entities do belong to multiple parents in the, hyperbol uh, in the hyperbolic space of uh, DBpedia. So more results on this can also be found in the paper mentioned here. Uh, please uh, go take a look uh, if you want to uh, get to know more results on this. Thank you. So the learnings that we get from uh, knowledge graphs is that hyperbolic space is simultaneous is better at simultaneously capturing spatial and hierarchical structural information by pseudo querying the uh, the knowledge graphs. The ablation study uh, shows the clear importance of using relatively complex queries and hypes representation in congruence uh, with downstream tasks. Uh, tells us that type can be used uh, with or without additional information such as uh, semantics. 
The hyperboloids can also be visualized in a Poincare ball for better human comprehension. So uh, I'll now hand over to Nikhil, who will talk about applications to product research and uh, NLP. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, Narendra. Let me uh, share my screen. Just give me one sec. Okay, hopefully um, you can see my screen. Um, if not, just let me know. Cool. Um, yeah, we're also a little over time, so I'll just try to speed up a little bit, um, and hopefully I'll cover everything. Um, so uh, just just like what Duredra mentioned, uh, we can actually use these hyperbolic representations for uh, product search and, and other applications. Um, now, product search is kind of pretty, uh, quite different compared to a standard uh, knowledge graph query. At first of all, when people kind of search for items on, on a website, something like Amazon, um, they don't you know, type in queries which are in logical form. They usually type in natural language queries, or you know, sometimes the queries are not even natural language. They are just like arbitrary keywords, and, and they expect to, to kind of find the right item that they're looking for. So one challenge is how do you convert queries which are not in logical form into logical form? And the other, uh, uh, the other uh, criterion where you know hyperbolic embeddings really shine is the fact that the products actually are organized in a hierarchical catalog. So if you think about you know the catalog in the U.S., you would have the country and then you know different kinds of different categories of products, different colors, different brands, so on and so forth, until you finally get to the final product. So there's a very clear hierarchy as to how the products are actually organized. And so that's where we can actually make use of hyperbolic embeddings. And the key here is to extend the, the idea of hype that Nurendra talked about is how can you actually learn these logical reasoning steps from the queries that customers have done. Um, so uh, uh, this paper, uh, and again, I'll, I'll you know highly encourage everyone to just go take a look at the paper because it has a lot of, lot of results that I might not cover here and many other ambition studies. Um, uh, and the, it, it, it learns uh, the query I, representation. I think uh, the screen that you're sharing uh, is, I don't think the slideshow is being shared on the screen. Oh, what's being shared then? Uh, it's the presentation slides. It's the PowerPoint view. Sorry. Oh, so let's see. What if I just uh, share a different one? Just give me a sec. Hold on, just just one sec. All right, stop and start again. Okay, how about now? Yeah, uh, now it's good. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Excellent. So, um, yeah, so the way uh, Anthem works is as follows. We have the standard two tower architecture that is pretty common in, in uh, you know, web scale retrieval or product retrieval. Uh, on the one side, we have the query and we use character trigrams for the queries. And that's just something we found works well. You know, we experimented with unigrams, bigrams, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then the queries are then translated into these hyperboloids. Uh, we can also do the same thing in the Euclidean space, in which case you just have a standard box embedding instead of the Euclidean, uh, I'm sorry, instead of the hyperboloids. Um, we combine them with the same attention module, everything that, that was talked about uh, in the earlier part of the tutorial. And finally, you get a bunch of hyperboloids for the query. Um, and, and it's important to note that the queries are actually hyperboloids. And this is, this is good because certain queries are uh, broad. Right. If someone says searching for Nike shoes, that's like a lot of different products. Whereas if someone's searching for 
red Nike shoes, size 12 for men or something like that, then those, that's a much narrower search space that you need to search over. So the volume that the hyperboloid actually encompasses allows you to kind of retrieve, you know, the right set of products. So the queries are hyperboloids and the products are just vectors in hyperbolic space. So we kind of do the same operations for the products, except they are just uh, point embeddings. And then, you know, they're combined and you can kind of do your standard uh, a loss function for retrieval, uh, determining, you know, <clears throat> the positives of what products are actually relevant for the queries and negatives of pro products that are irrelevant for the queries. So um, that's how the network is trained. And um, uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, point you to the paper to just, you know, get more details on it. And I'll just show a bunch of results here. So um, let's skip over the baselines here. So basically, uh, th this table kind of shows results for two different data sets. The one on the right is a public just e-commerce search relevance data sets. And you can see that Anthem, which is the last two rows uh, in this table, outperforms pretty much all the other baselines we consider. And we considered baselines like BERT and LSTM, which are more like text-based, uh, match pyramid and con like convolution style methods and other a bunch of other retrieval methods. Um, the other interesting thing to note is that pretty much you know, across the board, whether it's NDCG, MAP or MRR, um, Anthem actually outperforms all these different baselines, which shows that, you know, using these box slash hyperbolic representations is good. Um, and, it, and, you know, also the fact that, you know, because the products are actually organized the way they are, they, they give pretty high um, performance gains. The data set on the right is actually an internal data set from Amazon, and that's where these numbers are all relative. So uh, R2 is kind of a baseline. So let's just assume that's zero. And then all the other performances are uh, relative to the performance of uh, R2. And again, you see that, you know, uh, E Anthem, which is the Euclidean variant where we use box embeddings and Anthem outperform all the other different baselines. The other data set uh, and the other task actually is this kind of uh, an interesting one. So this is another sort of internal uh, proprietary data set where the task is as follows. So given a particular query, we want to find if a product is actually an exact match. And, and this is kind of important because, you know, sometimes customers search for something like an iPhone and they buy an iPhone charger. So behaviorally, an iPhone charger ends up being relevant for an iPhone, but clearly that's not the actual intent, right? When you're searching for a phone, you want to show phones and then you want to show things like cases and chargers and things like that. So, um, uh, so this is just a binary classification problem that says given a query and an item, is that an exact match or not? And again, uh, relative uh, to the baseline R2, uh, these performances, you can see some methods perform worse, some do much better. BERT actually is the baseline which consistently seems to do best out of the bunch of the things that we considered. And again, Anthem, uh, both the variants of Anthem actually um, outperform all the other baselines. Cool. And, and even when you look at the results, they actually tend to make a lot of sense. So not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. Uh, in the first example here, you see there was a typo from a, uh, from the customer. Um, Avino was misspelled, but Anthem actually finds the right moisturizing lotion rather than, um, in this case, CeraVe, which is a substitute, right? It is still a moisturizer, but it's not what the customer actually looked for. Um, similarly, in the middle, you know, when Pokemon movie was searched for, we actually retrieve the movie and not uh, a, the Nintendo DS game. Um, and, and the same for PlayStation consoles. So again, uh, the, the, the reference is down here uh, in the slides. Um, I think the slides will also be shared later. So you know you can go find the paper and, and check out a whole bunch of other results. So the learnings that we had from product from applying hyperbolic um, networks to product search is that these hyperbolic spaces are much better at capturing both the spatial structure of the query, which is, you know, certain queries are broad, certain queries are narrow, and also the hierarchical structure uh, from the catalog itself. Um, we have ablation studies and stuff in, in the paper. We can see that, you know, these attention mechanisms actually uh, help quite a bit. Uh, all right. Now, moving beyond search, the other place where hyperbolic networks can actually be applied is in uh, the task of natural language inference. So, uh, the SNLI data set is pretty standard. I probably don't need to you know, spend too much time explaining what that is. You just have to predict if a second sentence can be inferred from the first one. But there's a variant which is called prefix where the idea is if let's say two sentences are given A and B, uh, the, the model has to decide if the second sentence is a noisy prefix of the first sentence or if it's a completely random sentence. So it's still a, a binary classification task, but it's slightly different from the NLI uh, 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 task itself. 
And then there's a variant of the prefix task called prefix Z percent, where uh, the Z actually just shows how much of the prefix is actually randomly uh, 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 dithered. Okay, so for every random first sentence and the prefix, you generate a second sentence by randomly replacing Z percent of the words, and then the task is exactly the same as before. Uh, so imagine the prefix task to be essentially a harder version of the SNLI task, right? Because you still have to find if the rest of the sentence follows logically from the first part of the sentence, but uh, it's 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 just noisy. So you know it, it's not straightforward to do. And the models compared here were basically fully Euclidean networks. Uh, so there are three comp two components for each network. Right? One is the encoder, which is which takes the text and comes up with the text representation, and then a classifier that that takes the representation of the encoder. And and so we can play around with whether the encoder has to be hyperbolic or whether the classifier has to be hyperbolic. And so that's what you see in this table. Uh, and you see that you know uh, for the SNLI task, actually just doing things in the Euclidean space tends to work pretty well, although the hyperbolic version comes pretty close, 81.5 versus 81.2. But then for the prefix task, which is you know admittedly a, a little, um, uh, it, it's, it's a little weird and, and like a challenging task, the hyperbolic networks tend to outperform the, the Euclidean network by about you know one percentage point. And, and this gain starts getting larger and larger as the amount of noise increases as you go from left to right uh, in this table. Interestingly, uh, you see that the, the, the encoder being hyperbolic seems to be a lot more important than the actual classifier. So even the standard Euclidean multinomial logistic regression model tends to do, actually tends to do a little better than a fully hyperbolic group. And the reason for that we see is just the way these embeddings are learned, right? So uh, here you see the results on a Poincare ball. And once the embeddings are actually learned in the hyperbolic space, which is these red and blue dots, uh, the classification boundary need not be uh, hyperbolic. Like even a linear classification boundary here on the right gets you the same result. Um, if you look closely, like you can see that, you know, actually a, a circular classification boundary might actually end up doing better so long as it's learned, but at least, you know, that, that requires a lot of tuning and, and at least when the authors here in this paper um, in 2018 tried it, they weren't able to get significantly better performance. So that's that's where uh, uh, we see that you know there's no real apparent benefit of using the hyperbolic version of logistic regression, but it's it's pretty crucial to encode the text uh, in the hyperbolic space regardless. Okay, and, and the final application uh, I want to talk about is combining graph neural networks along with text. So typically, if you think of these large scale GNN models with text features, Usually what people do is they first encode the text using you know, some language model of choice. And then that's used as a feature embedding for nodes. And then the entire graph is then fed into a GNN. So you know, it's almost like the text is encoded separately and the graph and the GNN then just encodes the graph uh, structure. But instead, the, the question we wanted to answer is can we actually simultaneously encode this, this information um, you know, together to have a graph plus text model. And there's been some recent work in, in trying to do this in the standard Euclidean space. Um, and as uh, Nirendra mentioned earlier, graphs are a very natural um, playground for actually using hyperbolic embeddings because locally, at least you get three structures in graphs, right? Maybe you know, data sets like Quora might not help, but most real world graphs are not like Quora and most real world graphs are pretty sparse and, and locally very tree-like. And so these hyperbolic, uh, representations which work very well for hierarchical data actually work very well for graphs. Um, the other thing is that you know uh, there is a smoothing problem in GNNs. And so if you go too deep in a GNN, then uh, the, all the node embeddings end up becoming similar. And so it's, it's also a challenge to you know, capture very long range information uh, when you train a GNN model. And that's one more problem that we wanted to um, solve in this paper. Okay, so, so basically we try to use both the text information which is like local information and then the local neighborhood of the graph and then also the global information, which is several hops away and try to train a model. So the way this works is you have the text input for nodes one and two. And then of course you have the sparse adjacency tensor of the graph and tensor if it's a heterogeneous graph with multiple relationships. Uh, if not, just imagine that to be a matrix for the sake of, um, you know, to, to keep things simple. So that's the input. We have uh, text encoders for both and they are trainable. So um, I, I believe, uh, yeah, yeah, this can be like a BERT model or, you know, uh, any of the variants of BERT, like Roberta or whatever. Uh, okay, good. So now these text encodings are then added to the adjacency tensor. So it, essentially you have the adjacency matrix that 
for the sake of this discussion, let's just assume it's a matrix. The matrix acts as a mask, right? So it tells you what nodes are connected to what, and then you can kind of uh, use that along with the text and embedding to kind of get uh, like a semantic variant of the, the adjacency matrix. Uh, and then you can pass that through a hyperbolic uh, GCN. And, and note that, you know, of course, the early layers will only capture the local information. That's what you see here in this first circle. And then as you go deep, you'll go from one hop to two hops to three hops. And eventually you can actually connect, obviously, you know, if you have enough graphs, oh, sorry, have enough hops, then you can go from one end of the, of the graph to the other. And you can actually detect these pretty interesting meta paths that I'll show you um, at the end here. So, you know, this just shows a particular meta path that started from this top left to the like, bottom right corner here. Um, and then of course you, we have the standard self-attention mechanism to combine these representations and then you, a loss function depending on the task at hand um, to solve it. Okay, so here we specifically show performance on link prediction models. Of course, you know that just depends on the loss function you use here. Uh, you can replace the loss function to do node classification, to do whatever else you want, uh, but we focus on, on link prediction. And again, um, we tried it on a bunch of different data sets uh, we used text-based baselines, purely text, which is BERT, graph-based baselines, one model that combines text and graph, but in Euclidean space, and then this one, our method, which combines text and graphs at hyperbolic space. Um, and in almost, in, in pretty much all the cases, you can see that the, uh, the model that combines text and graph in hyperbolic space outperforms all the other baselines. Again, sometimes the gap is pretty significant, you know, Sometimes, for example, for Quora, sometimes uh, it, it's it's not. Uh, and interestingly, you can see that you know from an ablation study, we can kind of get a sense of what components are really important. So uh, I'd ignore the residual side. That's again like a detail in the paper that that you can kind of get a sense of like what we did. We tried to use residual connections, but really, if you look at the performance of test GCN without just using text, right? So if you only used graph performance drops from 0.82 to 0.78 or 0.63 to 0.6, right? So there is a pretty substantial decrease if you ignore the graph uh, altogether. At the same time, there's a substantial decrease if you ignore uh, the hyperbolic uh, embeddings, as the, the hyperbolic GCN layer. So if you do a Euclidean variant. And so this, this kind of lends credence to uh, the fact that, you know, there is hyperbolicity in the data. And uh, I'm sorry, there is this local tree-like structure in the data. And that's where um, um, using hyperbolic layers actually is pretty beneficial and the gap is pretty large. And this goes back to the hyperbolicity uh, uh, constant delta that, that Narendra was talking about in the, in the earlier part of the talk. Okay, and the other thing is the, the, the computational complexity, right? Turns out that, you know, because we use sparse hyperbolic convolutions as opposed to the standard dense convolutions, the training time actually reduces as the graph becomes sparse. And this is actually not the case for a lot of other baseline methods. Uh, because they don't really necessarily take advantage of the sparsity. Um, so on the x-axis here, it's the negative log of the sparsity ratio. And you can see that they know as the graph becomes sparser, this is the same data set, except the graphs getting sparser and sparser, the, the trading time uh, goes down. And, and the other thing you can see is it's also robust. So because we are integrating text as well as graph, and because you know we are actually using the long range dependencies to do some kind of regularization, as you kind of make the data set more noisy, the performance actually doesn't drop that much. So on the left here, you see the percentage of text that is replaced in the, in the node, node features itself. So if you, you know, either drop some words or replace it with a random word, what's gonna happen? And as you replace more and more text, all the other performance, all the other baselines kind of drop in performance, whereas um, this one stays pretty flat. Same when you start dropping nodes. So now the text is fine, but the graph is noisy. Again, you know, because there is this regularization happening, it kind of retains performance. Uh, of course, if you do both together, then uh, the, there is a bit of a performance drop, but it's kind of pretty consistent with a bunch of other baselines um, where, you know, it's, it's a, like a linear decrease, but it's still better than others. And, and note that you know other methods like graph former actually that drop is pretty significant. So when the data set is clean, they perform pretty well here, as you can see, if you can see my pointer, but then as the noise increases, the drop kind of becomes pretty drastic and all like a standard GCN actually ends up working better than um, methods that actually combine text and graph. So it's almost like, you know, that text ends up making things uh, or modifying the text uh, makes the methods work pretty poorly.
Okay, and finally, uh, you can actually look at the meta paths that were actually uh, learned in this case. So uh, here you can see that you know these are heterogeneous graphs where customers who viewed something like plastic wallet inserts also viewed this other uh, product, you know, and they viewed this other product, so on and so forth. And then because we have this information, uh, they were able to uh, we are able to predict this extra link, which is you know looking at co-view and also view and also by information, we can predict also by information here as well. Um, add the same thing, here's another example, which is more of the movies and, you know, necklaces and things like that. So these are like trinkets, essentially, uh, you know, like uh, a skull necklace and a swan necklace and things like that. And so if customers ended up viewing a bunch of things and buying some other stuff, then we can use that to make predictions of what they can, what else they might be interested in buying. And this, this makes the recommendation systems that actually uh, work at, at industry scale uh, work pretty well. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, that was the the application section. Uh, before we move on to the future work, um, I'd like to see if you know people have any questions, not just for this section, but any of the previous sections as well. Uh, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, and, and please, please feel free to, uh, you know, submit your feedback uh, at that link provided so that uh, we can improve this tutorial uh, for, for future ratings. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, then um, I'll hand it back to, to Narendra. Oh uh, yeah, thanks a uh, thanks a lot, Nikhil. Uh, let's uh, yeah. yeah. So now we're going to talk about what future directions of research we can see for this uh, hypervolume neural networks. Uh, from a conclusion point of view, let uh, I'll try to summarize what you've learned from. Andra, the, uh, your slides are. Yeah, I might want to share again. Uh, is this good? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> All right. Uh, so uh, from a summary point of view, uh, the things that we've learned from hyperbolic neural networks uh, uh, are below. The first thing is that hyperbolic space is generally better at capturing hierarchical features. And this is something that we see due to its exponential growth and volume. Uh, as we increase the radius of uh, the hyperbolic uh, Poincaré ball or the Klein model, we see that it is able to capture much more intense hierarchy, which is much more uh, increasing depth of uh, tree-like data, set, data sets. Uh, another thing is that hyperbolic space uh, can also be simultaneously used to capture spatial and hi hierarchical structure information. And we've seen that in our hype model and uh, where we see that we can capture the spatial and hierarchical information in the form of hyperboloids. And another point of note is that uh, uh, like having the, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So another point of note is that these, uh, the hype model can also be trained by just pseudo querying the knowledge graphs. And we do not need to have uh, a label training set uh, to train our uh, knowledge graph representations in the hyperbolic space. And then from the fraud research application, we saw that this attention mechanism can be used to capture intersection and union operations. Uh, and then Hype's representation also can be used in congruence with matching architectures uh, to perform uh, for downstream tasks, such as query matching or anomaly detection and so on. And this hyperbolic space can also be visualized uh, for better human comprehension. However, uh, if we look a little closer, we find certain interesting challenges in this field of hyperbolic neural networks. So some of them have been listed before. Uh, the first one is that hyperbolic networks suffer from practical implementation challenges. There is uh, non-availability uh, non of specific uh, objective functions. The field of Euclidean architectures has been developed for a long time. 
and we have come up with several uh, objective functions uh, several uh, problem specific objective functions like uh, for classification or regression or for uh, prediction analysis etc but such things are not yet available in the case of hyperbolic space another is unstable training and non closure of hyperbolic networks uh, the training of these hyperbolic or uh, hyperbolic networks often results in null values and this is uh, another problem because not all hyper uh, or not all uh, vectors in algebra are hyperbolic vectors next we have uh, its application to complex tasks so right now they have been mostly limited to representation learning in nlp and computer vision but there are uh, several uh, places where they can also be used to more advanced and complex tasks such as hierarchical focus etc and another uh, need is to develop scalable pretrained architectures the arc, i mean the models that we have right now they can work for uh, small graphs or even a medium sized graph with 10000 nodes but the ones we see in real world have millions of nodes inside them and hence we need to uh, develop scalable pretrained architectures that can leverage gpu operations and then uh, we also need uh, more hyperbolic libraries that can make the access to this field easier currently as we saw in our first module a lot of theoretical background is required for uh, to start off in the field of hyperbolic networks and a certain level of abstraction or standardization uh, in terms of libraries or tutorials can help the initiation of new researchers in this area so uh, let's focus uh, first on the implementational challenges we saw that uh, there are already some research uh, studies such as the pseudo point carry uh, space and the hyperbolic networks plus plus formulation uh, which try to solve the implementational challenges however there are some uh, problems that still remain first one is the development of objective functions right now we are uh, limited to hyperbolic distance which is equivalent to a simple l1 norm and so that i see a significant scope of uh, development of complex classification and regression objectives that can help further the field uh, along and then along the lines of development of adam for euclidean spaces further study into hyperbolic gradient descent is needed uh, right now uh, in the poincare pseudo poincare space we are able to uh make sure that at least uh, the complicated architectures run through a uh, euclidean uh, uh euclidean back propagation but we would want to avoid even that like we would want to have a stable uh, gradient descent in the hyperbolic space itself and next we have uh, that we know that not all euclidean points are hyperbolic points and this leads to several uh, issues in the development uh such as i mean null values was that example but there is a scope for uh, practical development of specific hyperbolic libraries which are able to uh, operate only in the hyperbolic space there could even be hardware uh, specific to these hyperbolic libraries can uh, hyperbolic space that can be developed uh, and hence uh, or we could develop some new theories uh, to satisfy the bound limitation of hyperbolic space in the context of uh deep networks next we want to extend this to complex applications while graph research i mean uh, graph research into hyperbolic space has been extended to complex problems such as logical reasoning it has taken around uh, it's been like 5 years now since uh, the idea of uh, hyperbolic space was first conceptualized for graph research and uh, we are at a stage where uh, it has been extended to logical reasoning problems however uh, in the case of nlp computer vision or networks this uh, application remains very limited to representation learning we know that natural in natural language process uh, processing the dependency tree structure of sentences is uh, definitely a systematic tree so this can be used towards uh, several uh, problems such as machine translation question answering or document search and then in the case of uh, computer vision as well we see cns capturing uh, local information and then using pooling to then hierarchically preserve it uh, we have but if we use hyperbolic space for developing such hierarchical features 
uh, hierarchical focus, then we'll be able to uh, do much better in uh, the tasks of computer vision. Similarly, in the case of networks, we want to not only see how the nodes of a network interact locally, but also look at their topologies and uh, their uh, overall structure. And we want to aggregate information hierarchically to the main node. And hence, networks is another possibility where which can be extended to uh, cover complex applications. And another uh, problem is uh, GPUs. Now, modern deep learning architectures uh, need GPUs for their uh, addition and multiplication operations. They have significantly uh, speed uh, speeded up the uh, Euclidean architectures, and they are not able to do that for hyperbolic space. The main limitation is the use of uh, inverse tangent and uh, inverse uh, tangent hyperbolic functions, basically. We, are, we see addition or multiplication that is supported by GPUs and it takes a very few number of cores. But if you go to hyperbolic operations, uh, this uh, same uh, addition and multiplication needs much more compute and it's not even scalable. Uh, so we can't really use batches and operate on them. We have to limit ourselves to one particular sample and we can do it parallelly as different threads but we cannot really manipulate them as tensors, which, uh, which is the major power of GPUs. So we need to develop uh, such scalable formulation for GPUs uh, for hyperbolic space where we can batch uh, data. I mean, uh, we can process data uh, in batches and then that would speed up the process significantly uh, on GPUs. Subsequently, we need further development of large networks that can utilize uh, the, uh, the learning, different learning methods. So we have the pre-training and fine-tuning approach, uh, which works uh, using transfer learning. And we have the compro uh, continuous improvements mod improvement model that can utilize curriculum learning. Such approaches have not yet been developed in the space of uh, hyperbolic networks and can be worked on in, future, in the future of this research. Uh, so another point is about the abstraction and standardization of uh, the hyperbolic networks theory and architectures. So our, our toolkit, Gravzu, and this tutorial are a step in that direction. The abstraction would specially help the application-oriented research uh, who would just want to use uh, hyperbolic networks as black box frameworks and not really want to analyze it, uh, not really want to know about the theory behind what goes on inside. Uh, and there is also a need for interpretability frameworks. So we have line and SHAP and several other methods that can interpret uh, Euclidean architectures well, but we do not have something uh, that can comprehend the hyperbolic networks properly. And such frameworks would improve the trust of the uh, users in hyperbolic networks, and hence the development would be really useful. Uh, this would also, in general, uh, improve the human comprehension of these networks, and researchers can then conduct uh, can identify specific problems with hyperbolic networks and conduct these targeted uh, studies into the problem areas so that they can figure out uh, solutions that are specific to the problems of hyperbolic networks instead of solving the architecture as a whole. Uh, this is a set of references that we have used to prepare our slides. Uh, please, please feel free to go over them. This is also available on the website. So you can uh, get these from there. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for all your attention. And the toolkit is available on the given link. You have uh, QR codes for the website, the uh, toolkit, and the tutorial slides. Uh, please feel free to scan them and uh, go to those locations. If you have any questions, uh, if there are any questions that we're not able to answer now, please uh, find me at the given links. You can also mail me at the given ID, and I'll be happy to uh, answer all such questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention.